Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Comics Rot Your Brain, the show where screenwriters talk about the comic books that we love, mostly from the 80s. I'm one of your hosts, I'm Stephen Bagatorian. And I'm your other host, Chris Derrick. And Chris, uh, this little episode we recorded today is uh, maybe my favorite episode we've done. And like, I don't know, honestly, man, this might be my favorite episode we ever do because talking about Trevor Von Eden and Thriller was one of the reasons I wanted to do this show. So I'm so excited we're doing this. And uh, let me just emphasize here. From hold on, everyone. hold on, hold on, cause, because those are some big words. Those are some <laughs> big words. Yeah. Let's let the yeah. people know what we're going to be talking yeah, about. Yeah, 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 exactly. What are we talking about here, people? What are we talking about? Um, we are talking about Frank Miller's first choice to draw Batman Year One was this genius artist. Who exactly are we talking about here? Are we talking about David Mazzuchelli? Are we talking about uh, Klaus Janssen? Are we talking about uh, some other legend from the 80s? No, we are talking about a legend from the 80s who has been overlooked in an egregious way. We're talking about Trevor Von Eden. And uh, Trevor Von Eden is uh, somebody who, as you're gonna hear us talk about at length in this episode, we feel has been overlooked in a way in comics history that is just insane because the guy is one of the greatest comic artists ever to grace the pages of DC or Marvel Comics. And Chris, <laughs> I'm ecstatic that we got to devote so much time to talking about Trevor and his work and Robert Lauren Fleming's work on this insanely extraordinary book called Thriller. I want to set the stage to everybody uh, to let people know this book came out in 1983. Here's what was going on in comics and in pop culture. In comics, DC's top-selling book was the New Teen Titans. And this year, in 83, that's when they introduced the character named Terra. And that's when the storyline with her culminated in the famous storyline called The Judas Contract, where Deathstroke's son, uh, Jericho, teams up with Dick Grayson when he first becomes Nightwing over at Marvel uh, the X-Men was the top selling comic at Marvel, but also probably of, of, of all comics. And and this was the middle of the most influential run that was penciled by Paul Smith. You know, this is where we got comics like uh, Professor Xavier is a Jerk, the Morlocks, and we find the introduction of Storms like Mohawk and that punk biker look. And, and, and also this year, the movies, here are some of the five films that came out that were like the biggest films of the year. We got Return of the Jedi. We got Terms of Endearment. We got Flashdance. We got Trading Places. We got War Games. Top five songs on Billboard that year were Every Race You Take by The Police, Billie Jean by Michael Jackson, Flashdance by Irene Cara, Down Under by Men at Work, and Beat It by Michael Jackson. So and speaking of Michael Jackson, Chris, <laughs> I'm so glad you said that because that kind of brings us to one of the elephants in the room here. Why the hell is this comic called Thriller? It is so weird. Now, I guess the reason is because of Angie Thriller, sort of the omnipotent godlike floating head being that we see on the cover of Thriller number one. But beyond that, in a larger sense, this book came out exactly one year after Michael Jackson's landmark epic album, uh, also titled Thriller. So one year after Thriller is released in November of 82, DC Comics decides to put out Thriller the comic in November of 83, which has absolutely nothing to do with Michael Jackson. <laughs> So, on any level, on any level. It's, it's just so weird. It's one except of the for, ex Except for there was two genius artists behind the, you know, the music and the pencils. That's what we'll say. There you go. That's a parallel, right? You know what? We got Quincy Jones and Michael over there making their thriller, and we got Trevor Von Eden and Robert Lauren Fleming making this thriller for comics. So, you know, that's, that's a parallel. Um, and I got to say, just 
one last thing, and we're going to get into this really more in depth in the episode, but I, I just have to drop in a fi final bit of trivia about what went wrong behind the scenes at Thriller. Uh, this book was so ahead of its time, and here is the danger of being too ahead of your time, is that you might be so genius, you might be so incredible, you might be so forward thinking that you come out a little bit too early, you know, and you come out so early that people don't know what to do with you, including your own editors and the publishers and most of the fans, perhaps. But I will say this comic, like you just said, in terms of the time frame, Chris, it was so early. And when you think about what was going on in culture at that time, it was so, you know, not what this book thriller is. This book is so sophisticated and the vibe of it is so prescient. And you'll see there's so much stuff they got right in here that happens way later. But this is before Swamp Thing, before Watchmen, before Dark Knight. This is 83. I can't help but think what would have happened if this book came out three years later, you yeah. know? Would have been appreciated, maybe, maybe not. I mean, there was still all the issues that Trevor had to deal with at DC Comics in terms of racism and in terms of just like, just the insane madness behind the scenes that we'll get into more. But you can't help but wonder, you know, how this book could have been received differently if it had hit in the middle of some of the rest of the, uh, the 80s comics craze, which it was a little early for. Well, look, let's tell the people about that little bit of trivia or uh, not a trivia <laughs> yes. of that, like, you know, what could have been, you know, there's, yeah. th there's two like big, what could have been's that, th that surround this book. So read that, the, the you know, the stuff you're going to read and that, so the audience can kind of hear about okay. what's going yeah. on. No, you're right. Thank you. Uh, there was an editor on Thriller who is a young editor named Alan Gold who was assigned to this book by the higher ups at DC Comics, the higher ups who included Dick Giordano, a uh, legendary inker and also kind of behind the scenes here on Thriller. Um, and he chipped into ink a couple issues too, but it was really Alan Gold, the rookie editor behind the scenes who seemed to have by his own admission later on, no idea what was going on with this book, just did not understand really what Von Eden and Fleming were doing. And that didn't stop him, though, from judging it and from intervening in what we would say is a really unprofessional way to the point where things got so fraught behind the scenes that Alan Gold made made sure and saw to it that uh, Robert Lauren Fleming, the writer and co-creator of Thriller, was fired with issue number seven. And this led to the departure after issue number eight of Fleming's collaborator and co-creator, the great Trevor Von Eden. So Fleming was fired with issue seven. He was gone. Von Eden left after issue eight. And then there were a couple of other creators, Bill Dubé and Alex Nino, who were brought in to basically finish out the run of another four issues of Thriller. And so here's what Alan Gold decided to say in the letter column in the issue where he was announcing the departure of Robert Lauren Fleming. It's my sad duty to inform you Fleming Von Eden loyalists that this is the last issue of their thriller collaboration. Bob is the writer on a new miniseries for DC. It's called Underworld, and Gene Colan is the penciler. Watch for it. That miniseries did come out later. I don't think Gene Colan actually pen penciled it. It was a miniseries about cops. If memory serves, Ernie Colon, I think, eventually did it. Anyways, uh, he goes on to say, second, it's my pleasure to report that starting with issue number eight, a new collaboration begins to make history. Bill Dubé joins us as writer, joins us uh, picking up the sad tale where uh, last Bob wagged it. Sorry. I think that's a pun. Okay. Uh, it's downfall, uh, downtime, part eight. Bill and Trevor have been working together quite successfully elsewhere, and Trevor's work on Bill's script here is just beautiful. Okay, so there he's got a nice word to say about Trevor. Uh, but here's where Alan Gold goes left. And he says, concerning direction, I'll admit, Thriller has been a rather leisurely outing so far, possibly developing too slowly for its own good. Keep in mind, this is the editor of the comic, folks. <laughs> Starting with issue eight, things really pick up. Uh, satins shot down over Soviet airspace and everyone gets a good look at the schemes that have been percolating since issue one. So hang on for a jauntier ride. One last concern that's been on my mind since letters first started coming in on Thriller number one. Two kinds of letters were received. The first asked good naturedly, what the heck are you guys up to? The second sang our praises. I love it. It's so confusing. I have to reread it 20 times and I still can't figure out what's going on. Both those responses are disappointing to me. 
If Thriller is so rich that you can read it 20 times and receive new insights and other pleasures with each reading, that's great. But if Thriller is a muddle and 20 readings still leave a well-intentioned reader in the dark, that's awful. I want Thriller to require only one careful reading. That means one careful looking at the pictures, too, of course, in comic art to get the point of the issue. If we miss that boat, if Thriller is succumbing to some phony baloney mystification, passing for depth, please write. Call us every printable name in the book. Take us to task. Don't put up with artsy schmartsiness. Side note, it sounds like it's pretty clear what, what side of the aisle uh, you know, Alan Gold falls on in terms of his opinions here. He goes on to say in conclusion, believe me, None of us here has consciously tried to be artsy schmartsy. We've wanted to present our story in a somewhat unconventional way. Criticism helps us fine tune this big, probably bug ridden gizmo we've put together. End of sermon. One last appeal. Please continue to write. See you in 30 days, Alan Gold. Jesus Christ, man. What well, the crap so, are you doing here you're editing this comic what see, are you doing see here's the thing about this guy right he sounds like one of these people that's like a caricature of like a hollywood executive or someone like that <laughs> who's just like it's just gonna be entertainment it's gonna be entertainment we can't be doing art uh blah blah yeah. blah but the, it's crazy because yeah. you know this is right when comics started to become considered art and this yes. guy, like, I'm about to let some people know something that you told me. So uh, but this is the thing. What's crazy is we find out later on that Alan Moore was going to be the writer <laughs> on this book after Robert Fulming, uh, after Robert, uh, after Robert Fulming left the book. It was going to be, yes, that is so crazy. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. He wanted to. Alan Moore wanted I, to take I, over. I, like he wanted to because he saw the art and saw how cool it was. And he was like, this is my frequency and then what was crazy is alan gold said no he <laughs> said no to alan moore oh my god he, he chased off he chased off robert lauren fleming trevor von eden and alan moore and then alan moore goes to write on swamp thing so you <laughs> understand what this book could have been oh my god see this see this is what i was talking about earlier about like like what was like what like the could have been and the other could have been was like we said earlier it you know if this book had got to keep going and if trevor von eden felt more comfortable with dc he would have been the penciler of batman year one and history would have been completely different yes like, like have been. history would have been completely different so wildly um, different wildly different because as our title says frank miller wanted trevor to draw batman year one because frank miller saw thriller and he saw probably some of the work trevor had been doing on you know on batman and other things at the time he wanted trevor von eden von eden actually turned down batman year one but miller wanted him before mazzicelli that is a fact that is part of the record that's part of history i will say also part of history final note here and then i want us to be able to jump into this episode uh alan gold did later on repent and he apologized to trevor von eden and in this apology, I'm going to quote it briefly off of uh, Michel Fife's brilliant website, where uh, Michel Fife has uh, extraordinary content all about thriller and the history of it. And for anyone who's more curious, please go to michelfife.com and read everything that Fife has written about the history of thriller, because it's probably the single best source online to find all this uh, fascinating history out. Uh, but here's a quote from Alan Gold apologizing to Trevor Von Eden decades later. I believe he wrote this to him. The quote is, I might be to blame for DC's lack of interest in reviving thriller. Fleming left right after you did. He realized that DC could not offer a satisfactory replacement. In fact, uh, Dick suggested someone completely wrong for the job, Alex Nino. He was a good draftsman, but his art lacked the style, even poetry and mystery of yours. If I had been more confident as an editor, I would have demanded someone appropriate, but I wasn't and I didn't. Many people warned me that the writer Dick recommended to replace Fleming, Bill Dubay, was no good for the job. Looking back on it, I don't think I understood what you and Bob were doing and how it was different from generic comics. Again, I wish I had listened. Every issue was a fight. In fact, I didn't get what you and Bob were doing either until after you'd both left. 
I couldn't get the new writer, Dubay, to write anything interesting. I even rewrote scripts, but that just led to negotiations that satisfied no one. I had commented that I wanted better plots than Fleming had delivered. I believe I used Mission Impossible as an example. Maybe Dick put that idea in my head. And he took that to mean dumb-headed action and nothing but action. Uh, so there you go. That's Alan Gold. And I got to say, even in the process of apologizing, he manages to diss Alex Nino and Bill Dubé. And I don't know much about Bill Dubé, but Alex Nino is one of the legendary Filipino artists in the history of comics. He's one of the legendary artists in the history of comics, full stop. Although perhaps his issues of thriller were not the greatest because it just wasn't the right book or the right fit for him. There's no reason to diss Alex Nino while you're apologizing to Trevor Von Eden. Alan Gold, good Lord, man. Just be nice to these artists and just stop insulting people. But see, here's the thing, right? The, the reason why he's not... He, he even says himself he's not a he doesn't he's not he's not a good editor he's to become one is he's one of those guys who I can tell right now hates the fact that he's not creative and therefore yeah. that he's up here sitting around where he has to like be the 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 one who corrals the cats of the two creative geniuses but yes. he but he must go home at night and eat his heart out like knowing that he can't create anything nearly that good. Because he even said it right there. He goes, I try to write scripts and they turn out bad. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's it, man. Do it. Yes. He thought he could yeah. do it and he can't do it. <laughs> what? Can, can you imagine? Alan Moore. Alan Moore is asking to write this comic. Alan Gold says no. And then he's like, let me write these scripts. Oh, man. The hubris. hubris. The, the, the hubris like, and the wow. level of like. You know, I think I'm good when I'm not. There's a level of insecurity. There's a level of fear of just the, and, and there's a sense of like, I can do this because I'm the editor. So the people at DC, like Jeanette Kahn and, 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 and fucking Dick Giordano, they believe in me. So I'm going to do the stuff that, that, that I think is best. Skip the fact that I probably have bad taste. Yeah. So. Yeah, man. And you know, the quote that I think of here is just that there's that old truism that like, uh, I think, what is it like a, a little bit of a little bit of power is a dangerous thing or something like that you know like I, I might be butchering it but I I think you know the idea here is for sure that Alan Gold was um, feeling himself a little bit too much and instead he should have just opened his eyes and realized he had actual legitimate comic book geniuses in his midst and if he would have gotten out of the way and been supportive we could have had a legendary run that was completed on this book and we could have had more amazing work at DC Comics from Von Eden and Fleming and uh, you know it's just it's what could have been but that's why this podcast exists folks is to celebrate these kind of books and these kinds of creators who deserve more recognition and more shine so thank you all so much for tuning in thank you everyone on YouTube and in podcast land uh, if you enjoy what we're doing here please remember to uh, like and subscribe it really means a lot drop a comment in there too uh, we appreciate all the support and now uh, thanks and on with the show Steve, we are back this week with another episode of Comics Rot Your Brain, and we're talking about a book that is going to blow everybody's mind, because it blew my <laughs> mind reading it. We're going to be talking about Robert Lauren Fleming and Trevor Von Eden's Thriller, which is a book that I was not familiar with. Let me take that back. I knew of this book when it was out, but I didn't read this book. You know, there's always like... Well, so what do you spend your money on when you're a kid? Because <laughs> you don't know. Yep. But I'm super excited to begin to talk about this. I think this book is one of the most unsung shock your brain books that came out at this time. Came out in, in late 83. Um, and it's unbelievable. It's truly unbelievable. What you know, like the fact the fact that these guys did this book and that it got published at a major company. Because it feels like this feels, this feels like a Vertigo book, and this is, what, seven, eight years before Vertigo is, is even launched? And that's yeah. crazy. That's just absolutely crazy. Um, but it's but this book is amazing. This book is absolutely amazing. I'm so, yeah. I'm so, excited, to be, I'm so excited that we're talking about it. This has been one of the episodes of 
our show of Comics Rot Your Brain that I've been most looking forward to recording, um, as you know, Chris, uh, because Thriller, I could not agree with you more. It is like a mind-meltingly bizarre and ahead-of-its-time book. And it's also a book that I think I kind of missed at the time because it came out like about a year before I started reading comics because I started in 84. And I think this book just kind of fell through the cracks for me for a while. And when I finally discovered it, I genuinely could not believe what I was reading and what I was seeing. And uh, at this point, I think this book has attained the status of being something of a cult classic to people who are familiar with DC comics of this era. And, um, you know, it's worthy of that status. And I think it's worthy of a ton of examination and primarily in my mind for the absolutely jaw dropping fucking staggering artwork of Trevor Von Eden, who in my mind is probably the single most unsung genius artist of 80s comics. And I know we've talked about this before and we can get into it more now, but Trevor Von Eden was supposed to be the original artist on Batman Year One as per Frank Miller's original idea. And uh, that didn't happen for various reasons, but both Frank Miller and David Mazzuchelli and so many artists at that time were huge fans of Trevor Von Eden's work. And looking at Thriller and looking at the body of his work from that period, you can see why. Um, I really feel like this book and Trevor's artwork and also Fleming's storytelling, but I think more fully Trevor's artwork was just insanely ahead of its time. And like, it's really just a a stunning book to find. So I can't wait to actually uh, discuss it today. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying about being the unsung artist of the 80s I have to agree with you. I don't think, and I'm not saying that like begrudgingly, but I'm just like, this is a very strong point. And I think people would argue, ah, wah, wah. But there's nobody that I could think of who's as talented as this guy is who no one ever talks about. Yeah, there's exactly. People, yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, there's, yeah, there's people who are like really talented and people do, and their names like get brought up and stuff like that. And, you know, or, or some, you know, certain people who, become fan favorites and stuff like, you know, there's somewhat a book that everyone talks about and they didn't do a lot of work. I mean, for instance, like you could look at Matt Wagner, Matt Wagner didn't do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, he did Grindel and he did mage. And I mean, so he does two series in until maybe like in the mid nineties when he's asked to do some stuff. Um, so I'm not sure what else he's doing, but, but people know his name, this guy's work, like, like Trevor's work, is mind blowing. It's truly mind blowing. And I think it's crazy, but as a black artist at this time, he's getting, I mean, it's insane the work he's done. Like, you know, like we were talking before and you've got like the, and you've got the main title page for issue one um, mm -hmm. as a blow up in your house. Right. Like that. Like yeah, that, I do. That, yeah. There's a, a, <laughs> a double page spread. Double page spread. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because this book is insane, and this guy's art. I mean, like we talked about, Mas I mean, so you got you mentioned Mazzuchelli and Batman Year One, and like I can see so much of what this guy's work, how it would have shaped what was happening in Batman Year One. It's kind of funny because I was looking at um, Elsa, Elsa, or Elsa. Uh, Chartier's little, I can't remember how, I can't remember how to pronounce this woman's name, but she, oh, does yeah. a, she, but she does a podcast and she did an episode of Batman year one, where she kind of broke down some of the panels mm -hmm. and I look at it and I'm like, it looks like Trevor's work. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny you say that, Chris, because there was that amazing heroes interview we talked about a while ago where uh, David Mazzuchelli is being interviewed about Batman year one. And Mazzuchelli is asked specifically in the interview who some of his influences are, who are peers of his and some of who is his favorite artists at that time are. And I believe he only mentions two artists by name. And one of those artists is Trevor Von Eden. And if I recall, Mazzuchelli says something like, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says that Trevor's work is almost dangerous. It's so unpredictable and it's so wild. You never know what he's going to do. And it's just 
brilliant work. And Mazzuchelli was clearly a huge fan, as was Miller at that time. And so when you realize that some of the cats who were like the premier auteurs, genius cartoonists of that time were singing the praises of Trevor Von Eden, and yet Trevor Von Eden is someone you don't hear spoken about nearly as much as the rest of these cats. Like you have to look back at the work and examine it and take it seriously and ask yourself, why were the greatest artists of that time name checking Trevor Von Eden when they were asked who their favorite artists were in comics at that time? And I think it's apparent when you look at the work because it is just, it's gorgeous. And I got to say for me, as of the last couple of years, if you ask me, point blank, who's your favorite comic book artist right now? For the last couple of years, I would say Trevor Von Eden would be my answer. And I'm on a quest right now, digging up every single fill-in issue that he ever did. And like I've mentioned to you, even some of his fill-in work on books like World's Finest with Superman and Batman or Vigilante, the DC book, Trevor Von Eden's fill-in work. There was a Batman fill-in he did also. The annual. Yeah, yeah. Annual yeah, there, yeah. There, there's, there's the annual. And then there's also like an issue of Batman or Detective he did as well that are just, you know, annuals or regular issues, whatever, just one-offs here and there. They're all just fucking gorgeous. And they're all gorgeous in different ways. And there's a level of invention and creation going on in Von Eden's work that's really kind of unprecedented for mainstream comics at that time, unless you're talking about the people who are literally the all-time greats, like your, Mil- your Millers. Yeah. yeah, the icons, your Sienkiewiczs, your Millers, you know, your Mazzuchellis or whoever. And um, I think Von Eden sadly did not maybe produce as large of a body of work and maybe he never created like um, as many signature books at that time where he was associated with a giant success, like a Batman year one or something, but just the work that he did do, it's just jaw dropping and the level of invention and originality in it is just off the scale, man. So, so yeah. Look, there's a lot about that that I want to talk about. But that's, I mean, that, and we, and we will talk about it today. But, uh, but I, I think we might be getting a little ahead of ourselves, as we are wont <laughs> to do on this podcast. It's what we those do. Who've been listening on for several episodes, <laughs> you know, we get ahead about shit that we want to talk about. But anyway, so, um, um, well, well, I, I think the craziest thing about Thriller is you can't summarize this book, and <laughs> which is. Which is a double-edged sword <laughs> to a degree, um, but I mean, so we were talking about there's like a meanwhile that you know that kind of summarizes like what this book is about, and I, I think it'd be easier for everyone who hasn't read this to if we kind of went through that and kind of like talked about it because like the, the 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 biggest thing I can say is this is like an adventure comic in the realm of like shadow and doc savage in terms of like is a team of people who are out trying to do things who are not really superheroes they're operatives or agents of the of the main person and you know and that's i mean if you like those books like doc savage or the shadow or you know i mean those kind of things then you'll dig this book but you might dig it more because this book is kind of like a, it's kind of like that one. Was it was St. Kevish doing a shadow? Did he do some shadow? Yeah, work? yeah, he did. He for a while he did a run, which I'm sure we'll be talking about at some point with uh, Andrew Helfer writing yeah. it. It was right after Chaken did Chaken's the miniseries. Yeah. yeah, and and then Sinkevich relaunched the shadow as a regular ongoing series with Andy Helfer, and I think Sinkevich stuck around for the first six issues, and then passed the baton to Kyle Baker, who did an incredible run also with Andrew Helfer writing for like another 10 or 12 issues, this including, is yeah, including one fill in by Marshall Rogers, which was also brilliant. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there was the shadow uh, for sure. Sienkiewicz did an incredible shadow. But it's kind of like, you know, so I mean, like those kind of books, those kind of stories, that kind of pulp kind of stuff that was not too, I would say not too, um, it wasn't too prevalent at this time. You know, I was, th- th- there's a book I'm reading now is called, uh, the D- DC in the eighties, the Experiment. Yep. And, um, and Paul Levis is like compiled these things. And he was talking about how 
you know, because this book came out in 83, right? The Thriller came out in 83. You say that, like, in the 70s, a bunch of these comics that were around were starting to shut down. You know, he was, he's mentioning that Gold Key had shut down, was, was shut down recently, and, like, a lot of the Western comics and the war comics and these kind of, like, pulp thriller fiction stuff was all was, was all kind of disappearing by the late 70s, early 80s. And for DC to launch to launch a book like this with this kind of like you know batshit crazy kind of storytelling is a true kind of like it's a major gamble for them Mm -hmm. but it's an awesome gamble so so let's jump into the to so so we tell the the listeners like what this book is is about okay totally so Yeah, yeah, if we can, exactly. Uh, You mentioned the Meanwhile column, which uh, for those of you who were not reading DC Comics at the time, uh, Meanwhile was a monthly column written by Dick Giordano, who was one of the uh, DC sort of uh, top muckety mucks. He was one of the upper executive echelon at DC Comics, as well as being a legendary inker who was still inking uh, the occasional comic at that time, as we'll see here where he jumps in to ink two issues of this very book thriller uh, in the middle of the run. But uh, so Dick Giordano would do this column that would be printed in all the DC books where it would just be, you know, ostensibly a promotional column talking about some new book that DC was doing, but it was often pretty charming and kind of personal with anecdotes and whatnot. This particular column uh, this month, the, uh, the duties for writing the column were handed off to Robert Lauren Fleming. And uh, so he took over for Giordano and basically was allowed to write a one-page promotional piece for Thriller, where essentially this is Robert Lauren Fleming, the writer, pitching Thriller in this column that he knows is going to be published in every other DC comic. So here's how he pitches it. If you enjoy team books, such as the New Teen Titans, Batman and the Outsiders, the Legion of Superheroes, and the Justice League of America, prepare yourselves for Thriller, because it's not like any of them. Um, that uh, thriller refers to the main character, an omnipotent ethereal female who performs the godlike function of manipulating and coordinating earthly events, sort of a cross between Jesus Christ and my mom. Thriller's team is called the Seven Seconds because they're her seconds in the fight against crime and evil. Actually, they function more as operatives than as a team like the Shadows crew or Doc Savage's men. But if you get right down to it, they're not operatives either. They're an Italian family, the Salvatinis. Allow me to introduce you. Daniel Grove is the only normal Joe in this outfit. He's a cameraman for the Satellite News Network, and all he wanted out of life was to end it. Thriller had other plans for this reluctant hero. Data is a genius who lives in the backseat of his Rolls Royce. He drives the car with his brain. He's not interested in brushing his teeth or playing volleyball or seeing Superman the movie. He just wants information. Big, heaping gobs of it. White satin is beautiful but deadly. One brush of her fingers and you may die laughing or vomiting. You may fall asleep or stiffen like a board, and that's only assuming you won't just plain drop dead. She's the girl who everyone's in love with, but is it really worth it? Salvo is Tony Salvatini, Thriller's twin brother and a crack shot who can blow your eyelashes off at 30 paces or rip off a thug's windbreaker with live ammo. He's too good a shot to ever have to kill. His creed, only flesh wounds, only outpatients. I won't kill a fly, so don't ask me. Beaker Parish is an enormous synthetic Roman Catholic priest created in an Erlenmeyer beaker by two renegade Harvard medical students adopted by a Roman Catholic parish, including the Salvatini family. The artificial baby grew into a nine-foot-tall seminary student. Amen. Wow. <laughs> nine-foot-tall Roman Catholic priest who was created in a laboratory named Beaker Parish. That is one of our characters. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Back to the column. Proxy used to be Robert Forio, actor, before he almost burned himself to death, freebasing cocaine. <laughs> There's a superhero origin for you. <laughs> no, this, I mean, I, this is around the time that, that Richard Pryor, this happened to Richard Pryor. So I think that's yeah. where that's from. Wow. I think, I think. That, oh, that's wild. The synthetic skin that saved Proxy's life proved unstable. 
It tends to melt every 24 hours, so now he can become anyone for a day, depending on how he applies his artificial flesh. It comes in plastic bags. Cracker Jack is an underaged illegal immigrant from Honduras who is also a master escape artist, pickpocket, safe cracker, and contortionist. But his favorite occupation is watching television and eating Fruit Loops. That's my family. Hope you like them. They go on exciting adventures, fight horrible villains like Scabbard. He's got a three foot long scimitar sheathed in the skin of his back. That's right. <laughs> and make new friends like Kane Creel, rock and roll bank robber, uh, thinks he's you know who, uh, which is Elvis. Uh, hey, I know they're weird. That's family for you. And then he goes on to encourage everyone to subscribe to Thriller, and that's basically it. So that pitch actually makes this sound kind of almost like it is a team of crime fighters or heroes of some sort. But like you said, Chris, it's it's got its roots for sure in that pulp tradition. And, you know, Fleming calls it out here too, Shadow, Doc Savage. Definitely that's where the roots for this book are, more so than like a Superman or Batman or Teen Titans or anything like that. But man, that editorial, that column there makes it sound a lot more apprehendable than it actually is. Because oh, when you're when you're reading sure. it, like for I don't sure. know that I don't know that you really get half of that when you're actually reading the issues themselves. Well, I mean, you do it's okay, this is one of these books that the knowledge you it's not a book where you get everything in one issue it takes right. like a few issues it's like the cumulative effect of reading the issues and remembering what's happening and who these people are and what they're doing and what they're up to that be, that it begins to kind of like solidify what he's talking about so maybe by so that that was the letter common issue f- four probably by the time you get to issue probably by the time, by the time you read the issue four or the meanwhile column but probably by the time that you read issue four it, that'll all make sense to you it's not gonna make sense in the first first one two issues, and yes. it's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a crazy book that but it begs you to read it and to like understand it because you mm-hmm. read it and you'd be like, what is this about? And mm-hmm. it might be off putting for a lot of people, but it's not because the artwork is so fucking good. The artwork keeps you kind of like, like like keyed in in a way. I mean, there's a lot of books, history of comics where the art is terrible or, you know, or the story is terrible and the art maybe has you buying it, you know, some big guys like writing the story, something like that, whoever it is. And this, and you know, the stories are bad, but this is just not that the story is bad, but it takes a while for you to understand how he's cobbling it together. And I think that Robert Lauren Fleming, he just had a, he had a style of, of, of trying to like unspool the story in a very different way that, that if you invest the time and to read these first eight issues or seven issues that, that that Robert and Trevor did together, it is it's so well worth it. It's such an enjoyable experience because these guys are you know they mentioned the guy Scabbard. Now he's like this, he's like he's like a he's an Arabic killer, and he has this. And when you meet him in the beginning in issue one, the guy the cameraman like he kills that guy's brother like he beheads him the way ISIS was beheading people, like put it on camera. And it's kind of crazy because it's like in 83, I don't know if Muslim extremists were cutting up people's heads off like that on camera. I don't think that that was really being done yet. It's a fascinating thing for him to have kind of predicted that. Um, yeah, because this is just a few years after the... the um, the Iran hostage crisis. So there's no way. There's yeah. a, so the, the, the Islamic extremists hadn't really taken a hold yet on the whole Arab world. They were still kind of like stuck in, in Iran yet. Um, but it's, it's crazy that that's what happens in this book. And that's how the guy, Daniel Grove, gets gets brought into the world of thriller. It's interesting when you had read this now, and I didn't think about this when I was reading it, but you, they say that, that thriller is like this omnipotent, kind of god who uses computer to manipulate what's happening yeah and it's like this oracle before they did oracle huh that's a really good point yeah it is that same kind of idea and yeah this there are a lot of things about the book that do feel weirdly prescient like that 
and the Islamic extremist thing with the beheading being televised on live TV. And yeah, there are a number of things in here. And even even the character of Data and the fact that Data is controlling his car with his mind and it's like he's almost like a human computer. There's a lot of stuff in here that feels like Fleming was kind of looking forward into the next decade or two and correctly predicting some things. And And really reading the book now, there are some really fascinating and creepy moments where you're like, whoa, this was really written in 83, you know? Um, well, well, see, yeah. that's the thing that makes the book fascinating is that you read it now. This is 83. So this is almost, what is, 30, 38 years old? 30, I mean, it's, that, it's more, is it? Wait, it's, what, it's 93, 2003, 2013. No, you're right. You're right. It's like, yeah, 30, like 30, you're right. 38. 30, yeah, yeah. Old. And it's, it, and it, it feels modern. Mm-hmm. I mean, it feels like a modern book. Like, and 83 is, I don't know what, what's going on in the Avengers then or Fantastic <laughs> Four or, or X-Men. It's probably some, some overwritten stuff by like Chris Claremont. Yes. I, you know, whatever it is, it's not, um, I mean, I'm not saying those stories aren't good, but they don't seem fresh now. I think you go back and, and read yes. it now. And this still feels fresh in a way because it's so – it's so bizarre with, with how things are happening and he's, you know, and it's, and it's, there's a level of science fiction to it that is not too science fiction out, but it's science fiction enough that it feels very, um, it feels very fascinating. I think the way he discussed all the characters is pretty cool too, because you try to figure out who these people are in reading it and you don't quite know. Um, but I feel like Trevor, like, I'm I'm looking at issue one. I'm looking at page thirteen of issue one, and mm-hmm. and thirteen to fourteen. Mm-hmm. It's got around like seventeen panels on a page. Yep, you know, which seems like an obscene amount of panels, and it is an obscene amount of panels. But he tells the story very well visually. I think my one big criticism in this book completely is it's nothing to do with Trevor, nothing to do with with Robert it's whoever was doing the lettering of this book because sometimes they don't place the the thought balloons or the word balloons in places that are conducive to like make, making your eye follow the panels is as much as you want to but I think overall this is one of these books that this and it feels more like um it feels more like a prestige cable show like a mm. crime show mm. because there is, you know, crime stuff going on. It's just superheroing going on, but it's so much more about the family and the people and their relationships and how they're trying to figure out who they are. Cause obviously you have like the, 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 the with the, the Salvatini family, but you have Cracker Jack who is Honduran. You have data who's black and you have, um, the, the Daniel Grove who's all of his white. He's not part of the family. But they, but they operate as a family in a way that you know that all the work they're doing is about, you know, it like it binds them together as people. And when they go on these missions to kind of like, there's that big mission they have, you know, first four issues, they're trying to like stop s- Scabbard. That final kind of showdown they have, I guess, in issue four, when they, you know, find him on the train. I mean, they all, they've come together to work as a machine and it's a well-oiled machine by that issue, which is very much like what you would do in like a prestige show as opposed to like a, like a network show where they're already a good team by the end of that first episode, you know, it like yeah. takes, it takes them a while to gel. And I think that's kind of smart storytelling too, because you, um, because if you didn't spend so much time on the characters, the book would just all be about plot, you know, yeah. because it's all that, that it really could be about. And there's so many characters. I think later on in like issue seven and then eight, which is eight is not written by Robert Lauren Fleming. It becomes a very much plot, like driven story. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's easier to understand because you're not trying to deal with the emotions of the characters and what they're going through. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, I mean, so 
like different than other episodes of this show, it's kind of hard to go through every issue and talk about yeah. what was going on plot wise. <laughs> I think that would be a, a fool's errand because it is so oblique in the storytelling and it is so difficult to follow. There are missions, quote unquote, that the team is going on, but really the stories themselves are almost like there's so much more about the storytelling itself. And that sounds like a, like just like a weird sort of conundrum, but it's, it's like just the way that Trevor is choosing to tell certain moments and just the kind of moments that Fleming is choosing to write they're just there's there are so many unconventional bits here that it really is hard to describe it in a conventional way and have it make sense it, it's something that almost just has to be experienced and i know we're making this comic sound like it's a drug trip or something but it really does have kind of very psychedelic uh hallucinogenic properties to it in a sense cuz you're reading it and you're just there are moments where you're like wait what the fuck did that did that just happen are are, are they really doing this like it's really it's just it is captivating in how odd it is. And Von Eden's storytelling too, like you mentioned the paneling, Chris, 17 panels on one page. I feel like that is one of the trademark things that Trevor Von Eden did better than pretty much anybody I can think of in mainstream comics is that he was able to jam such an insane amount of panels on a page and yet it never looks cluttered or rushed or hurried and he just has simply the most inventive panel layouts from page to page that you're going to see anywhere in mainstream comics, certainly at this time. And he is the opposite of someone who uses a grid, like a six panel grid or a nine panel grid or whatever on every page. Trevor is reinventing the comic page with every single page. And that sounds kind of like uh, grandiose or hyperbolic, but genuinely reading Trevor Von Eden's work in Thriller and other shit that he did, it it's so enthralling because it's like, as a comic fan, you're witnessing an act of discovery on every single page. And I feel like Trevor Von Eden is literally inventing new storytelling mechanics with every page, literally just conjuring up a new way to show a train speeding through space in a comic book, conjuring up a new way to show someone shooting guns out of someone's hand, someone jumping, et cetera, et cetera. He invents a new way to show you something and then he immediately discards it. By the next page, he's on to some other invention, some other new means of storytelling. And it's got like just this incredible sense of discovery on every page like that. And it's just kind of got to be seen to be believed. And it's just, it's crazy to me. Hey there, beautiful people. Thank you so much for listening to Comics Rot Your Brain. This is Steve checking in with Chris. Uh, apologies for the interruption, but we just had to let you all know about a little thing called our Patreon, where for a measly two bucks a month, Y'all can get so much extra content that it's a little bit mind blowing. Uh, we're offering you at least two free episodes a month, two free solo episodes, one from Chris, one from me. It's gonna be a beautiful thing. And we're also offering a whole lot of other content. Uh, Chris, do you wanna tell the folks what else they'll get for only $2 a month? Right, so on top of the one-shot episodes, you will also get a, there'll be a quarterly Q&A from the listeners. You guys will be able to write into us and tell us you know questions about anything about comics what comics we love like artists we love like like writers like you know what are our thoughts on stan and jack you know just just crazy stuff that you know that you might want to hear also as a subscriber supporter you'll be able to uh to write in and tell us what book you would like us to cover or like a book a series a graphic novel it could be a run it could be like a lot of things but just let us know what it is you know and we will cover it in season two or season three um and so yeah so you can follow it at patreon.com forward slash uh comics out your brain and there will be a link in the show notes and uh steve what might you be hinting at for your mm. one shot mm, in my one shot episodes for this coming season 
One of the things I really am looking forward to covering is a uh, Carl Barks Uncle Scrooge story. And I'm not sure which one it's gonna be yet. There's a lot of classic options to choose from. I am a massive Carl Barks fan, one of my top five cartoonists of all time, had a huge influence on me as a storyteller. And you know, I was shocked to discover recently, Chris, that um, Carl Barks Uncle Scrooge stories were actually part of the chief inspiration for Indiana Jones. That George what? Lucas, George Lucas is on the record talking about how the Uncle Scrooge stories were a huge part of the inspiration for Indiana Jones. This shocked me. I literally just found this out last year. Blew my mind, right? Crazy. I can right? understand it. I yeah, can yeah. Understand they were like, it's crazy. Well, they're, they're globe trotting adventures where they'd be searching for treasure yeah. and. You know, yeah. there's some kind of like imperialist kind of capitalist overtones these days that are a little dicey. But, you know, as a kid, you're reading these stories and like, okay, you're not necessarily thinking so much about, oh, they're stealing ancient artifacts from other cultures. You're just thinking about <laughs> like, oh, they're having cool adventures. It's like how you watch Indiana Jones differently as an adult, perhaps. But, but still, the storytelling is just magnificent in terms of the sheer adventure and like magic of the Scrooge uh, tales, him and Donald and the nephews. Uh, Barks is just such a pure cartoonist and uh, those stories had a massive impact on me wanting to be a writer and wanted to be a storyteller and I just read them over and over again as a kid so I would love to to dive into a Carl Barks Uncle Scrooge story and just kind of riff on it for a while can't wait to do it that sounds awesome and you know I might dive into Stray Bullets I might do Ooh. that 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 first volume, the, the innocence of vanillism, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's a nine issue. So I, I'll, I'll read the floppies because I want to be able to read the letter columns, yeah, and and, and yes. just get like a sense of like who was reading at the time because it's always an interesting time capsule to read yeah. the letter columns. Issue, um, issue number two, issue number two of Stray Bullets has some uh, amazing people writing in, uh, really like prescient uh, folks who have great taste. Way Way ahead of their time. Way ahead of, time. Way ahead of, time. Way ahead of we'll, the curve. We'll, 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 we will see. We will, we will take a look. Yes. Yeah, so, so everyone, so please support the show. Again, once again, it's at uh, patreon.com forward slash comics watch your brain, or you can find the link in the show notes. And now we will get back to comics watch your brain. That's the thing that I think is it's impossible for us to convey verbally how inventive this guy is and how i mean when we talk about earlier how like mazzicelli and miller and i'm sure probably fucking every fun who was trying to be great from the early 80s to the end of the till the image the image people came on they all know this guy i mean mm -hmm. and he's and he's breaking everyone's head. like you know i'm just saying just something now on in p issue one page seven Mm -hmm. When, when, uh, like when Daniel grows his, he's his brother gets killed. He's filming it. Top of page seven is these five panels uh, all in a row. Yes, of his of Daniel watching his brother die, and I don't know if that kind of like slowing down the moment had been done before this. That's a staggering moment. I'm so glad you called that out, Chris, because you're right. It's a really original way to show something in particularly in a mainstream comic. It's this guy realizing and dealing with the fact that his brother has just been beheaded in front of him and there's dialogue and there is some, a little bit of dialogue there, but really you don't even need it. Honestly, you could take the dialogue out. No offense to Robert Lauren Fleming, but the storytelling is so strong visually in that moment that it's just stunning looking at that character's face over those five panels you called out. It's and what's, crazy. What's, what's really cool that he does. And now look, you see this now and you've seen it. Like I you, I started seeing this kind of work in like the mid 80s. I mean, the mid 90s. See it in, in like a lot of Vertigo books when they, when they want to almost put like a slow motion, like a, like a slow motion shot in a movie. But he's doing this in 83. But the coolest thing that he's doing is, it is and if you look at this, this page layout is, what most people do when they do this, it's like four or five panels in a row, and it's just the same image just kind of repeated. It says, you know, and they, they and they might be photocopying it, placing it down and placing it down and repeating, repeating. But if you look at this, if you look at the first panel, it's bigger than everything else. It's 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 over the black, it's extending into the margin. Yep. Right? 
And then as the moment gets more and more intense for the guy, the panel sizes get smaller. And just smaller. subtly though, just very, very subtly. Subtle. Yeah. And it was really cool. And also the shadow on his face in the in the penciling gets deep, gets more. So it's it's a little bit of shadow on the first panel, but a panel five, like he's like his yeah. whole half of his face yeah. is, is yeah. like By a shadow, totally in color, and it's like that's fucking cool. I mean, that's the kind. It's like you got to see this. I, I, we we got to put panels. Yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll put this. We'll put this page in the show notes. We'll try to throw notes, as, as many of these pages, pages that we talk about. We talk about yep. because you. I mean, and again, you look at it now, and you might be like, "Yeah, whatever." I've seen this, but you got to realize in '83, nobody was doing this, and yes. as a black man creating this kind of stuff, he's pissing people off with his technique because. That's just kind of the way stuff is. If you're this good, if you're this good and you're black, white people are going to be mad at you, um, particularly well, at this time, because that's 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 the way of the world. Well, we can definitely get into that a little later. Um, you know, if we want to touch on the reasons why Trevor uh, sort of felt like his enthusiasm got uh dimmed or you know extinguished on this project it had to do with a lot of behind the scenes stuff at dc and the way that he was being treated really disrespectfully and the racism that he was encountering in the offices at dc which really just kind of hurt his spirit and killed his enthusiasm for the work and it's really just a a goddamn tragedy because you know in my mind, Trevor Von Eden was one of the greatest artists working at DC Comics in this era. And the fact that he was not treasured and treated unbelievably well as this amazing artist at DC at that time is really a crime because this kind of storytelling is very rare in comics. This level of nuance, instinct, subtlety, and just artistic vision is so rare as a storyteller just this page you called out chris looking at this entire page it's like those five panels at the beginning you know which as you said by the last panel looking at that guy's face the shadow has increased to the point where it looks like a goddamn etching all of a sudden as he's really mourning his brother's loss then we pull back to a long shot to realize this guy is on the edge of a bridge about to jump and and you're on this long shot now seeing him on the bridge and then you zoom in slightly um, from above. It's a long shot from above. You zoom in now for the next panel. And so this is now panel, what is that? Panel uh, six, seven, panel seven, you move in slightly. Uh, panel eight, you zoom in just a bit more. Now you're like close in the guy's face with the scarf obscuring his mouth because of the wind. And then suddenly you pull back to this crazy like, Almost like Super it's not low a, angle, it's like a it's low like, angle, right? It's like a Dutch yeah. angle or like it's almost like a like a fish's point of view from the the river below this bridge that the guy's about to jump into. Who fucking does that? Who gives you a fucking Dutch angle fish's point of view at this moment in the storytelling? It's a wild choice, but it works so well. And then you're back to like this close shot on him you've got the river in the background and then you got a profile on him and then you got another profile on him okay we're still on the same page like right now everybody same page and then you've got a final tiny panel at the end where this guy is now kind of he's bathed in light and he's looking up and he says oh my god and the colorist is kind of killing it on this page too. And you got pinks yeah. and yellows and whites. Tom Zuko, uh, shout out to Tom Zuko doing really some amazing coloring for this time. And you turn the page and there is that stunning double page spread for my money, one of the best double page spreads in comics history, which is why I had it blown up, as you mentioned, Chris, and I got it printed on a fucking massive canvas and it's in my living room on my mantle right now because I love this image so much. I got it fucking hanging above my fireplace. And uh, it's just a gorgeous double page spread of the face of this omnipotent godlike being, Angie Thriller, who's like a woman slash god slash oracle. And it's her face as big as you can imagine, just massive, looming over the bridge where our guy's about to jump. And then on the side of the bridge, you have the credits for the comic and it says seven seconds and the coloring and the drawing are just exquisite. It's a stunner of a double page uh, splash. Well, I mean, the thing that's so cool, and I just realized this now, I didn't realize I was reading it, but it's like that segment when it's the five panels going across, 
Yeah. Is transitioning us from the from the Middle East because he's watching his brother get killed. Yes. To New York, wherever this is on the bridge, and it's like he does all of this in a sequence that is emotionally powerful. Yes. And it's a transition. Yeah. And it's like, what the fuck? I mean, it's fucking this, crazy. It's, it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. I mean, like, I, I I wanted to read you a quote. I can't find it. I was looking for like while you're talking because I think I, we got to talk about how he, uh, the like what happened to him with that uh, DC and yes. being disrespected because the quote I want to find I can't fucking find it. Are you looking in the the journal, the comics journal interview? No, no, no. It's an interview. It's a quote that I saw and I saved it on my phone one time that. Toni Morrison wrote Hmm. and she said that the ultimate purpose of racism is to distract you from doing your best. Hmm. And which I, when you think about it, it makes a lot of fucking sense. It's like, cause you get so taken off your game when you're, when some racist sentiment comes up. You know, whatever it is, oh, they call me the N word, and then all of a sudden, whatever the that you're dealing with is all become microscopic because that has got so much like so much importance, hmm. and it's like and we're and and we bring this up because, you know, in that comics journal interview that we're going to read from in a minute, he's talking about he stopped caring about this book in issue two, yeah, and there's still <laughs> and he and he's still on for another six issues, yeah, and some of the work is amazing. Like we're going to talk about something that happened in issue five that is some of the most chilling, some of the most emotionally chilling like panel work I've ever seen somebody do. We're going to get that in a minute, but I think this is important. I mean, it's just, I mean, and everything you just mentioned on this guy's panel, like the back and forth between the, 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 the overhead shots, the low shots, and it's not cluttered about what the storytelling is. Like you get it all. And there's what, there's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thir- thirteen panels in this one page, which I think would break most people. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, and Von Eden makes it look easy. easy. He makes it look easy. It almost looks effortless. And it's well, just. And, and that's the thing. That's the thing you were telling me before. Because I, I, cause I, I, part of his work, too, was really cool is his work, it, it, it doesn't look like it's. Been, been inked traditional type of inking style and it i mean it almost looks like he's just drawing you know like because it doesn't say ink it just says the artist so it's almost like he didn't do any inking like you know like like it's so it's not that it's rough but it's like there's this there's a power there's a, there's a, i think a lot of stuff, if you look at inking it like kind of like stabilizes the work you know, the sure. Usually like rough, traditional, powerful, yeah, it, it, comic like, book inking, inking does that. It's, it's stabilizer work, so you can kind of like grasp it. But his work is inked by himself. Like he, it's almost like he's he knows I'm not. No one's going to ink this. So I'm going to I'm going to have some fun with how I'm doing panel design, how I'm drawing faces, like the etching we were talking about on this guy's face. Like the etching on his face right here, an inker would take it all out. You know, yeah. an inker would just make it all. Black, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? You're totally right, and it's actually just. Shocking to me on one level that Von Eden is able to get away with the finish that he puts on his art at DC at this time, because no one was finishing their art with this level of roughness and sort of this gestural quality to the work. I mean, it really, it does look so kind of uh, like it's got this, this quality, like you say, where it is actually inked, but because of the way that he's leaving it so rough and with the energy and the life and the vitality of the work fully intact, it almost looks like, as you say, the way that people always see pencils and they're like, oh, there's this magic, this vitality that just gets lost so often once it gets inked and, and cleaned up. Von Eden doesn't allow that to happen. And I think that you've mentioned something a few times, Chris, in talking about his work here today, the emotionality of it. And I think that's something that I want to emphasize. And I think it plays into the choices he's making with these these marks that he's making on the page, these ink marks. It's Von Eden, I think, is really concerned with preserving emotion 
And I think he is all about the emotion in this storytelling. And I think he's very keyed into it in a way that very few comic book artists, very few cartoonists ever are. And I don't think Vaughn even cares about a polished finish. I don't think he cares if his work looks like Romeo Tangal or, you know, someone who is doing like really tight finishes. You know, Von Eden's not somebody who wants to have this super tight finish. I, I think he realizes that that's not what matters in comic book storytelling. And he comes from the school of Alex Toth and Toth is one of his biggest influences. And prior to Toth, um, I know Von Eden has called out Neil Adams as an influence. And I believe Von Eden worked at Continuity and Adams was something of a mentor to him. But it's interesting because I feel like Von Eden took that underlying sort of knowledge, that incredible foundation that you get from studying somebody like Neil Adams and kind of learning that school of drawing. But then he took the Alex Toth and more of like a European influence and threw that into the mix. And what he's left with is something that I think really does presage the style of people like David Maz David Mazzicelli and other people who did work that is also genius and exquisite in its own right. But Von Eden was doing this first, and he was doing it in a way that really, I think, had no peer at the time, because it wasn't just the finishes, it was the panel compositions also. And it's just not the finishes and the panel compositions, it's the underlying knowledge. And then it's not just that, it's the incredible deep emotion he's bringing to it. So you combine all that work. And that's why I like you know, it's going to sound fucking hyperbolic to hear us sitting here gushing about Trevor Von Eden and his work for two hours or whatever today. It's going to sound like we're exaggerating, but I'm going to urge. Not. We're, not. we're not. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's like, this is all fucking for real. And I urge everyone to go, you know, not only look at our show notes and we'll throw as much of the dope shit as we can into the show notes, but like, you should go buy Thriller. You should go buy any Trevor Von Eden comic that we're talking about from this era, because that's the era of Von Eden for me that I'm most knowledgeable about and most passionate about at this moment, because that's what I'm devouring is Von Eden's work in the 80s. We should say, by the way, that Trevor has continued to make work and has put out work since this time. I'm just not as familiar with it. And so I don't want to comment on it until I've had a chance to take it in. But Von Eden's work from the 80s is what I've been just swimming in for the last year or two. And, and I got to say, man, like I like it's without parallel. And it's it's just it's been just I, I don't know. It's been shocking to me to to not hear more people talking about Von Eden, which is why I wanted us to really make sure we had this discussion today so everyone could hopefully so gonna, hear it. Here's the thing. Of, I'm just thinking about this now. I didn't think about this when I was reading it because I'm, we're so used to this type of stuff now. Again, in reading Vertigo, because Vertigo steps out of doing superhero stuff, right? So that's the, re that's the real... Like that's the mainstream version of non superhero work, but and the beauty of doing non superhero work, if you're an artist and you got to be a good artist, is how will you make your, your your characters act on the page? Because the thing is, if I'm drawing Spider Man, I don't have to, like his face doesn't act because it's covered in a mask, right? You know, if I'm in Batman, there's, there's not a, I mean, like, I mean, yes, they'll draw a little like frowns and stuff in his, uh, in his mask where his eyes, his face would be, you know? So there's, there's cheating they do. But if you're Captain America, you know, don't see his face that much. Iron Man, you don't see his face when he's in the thing. In a hero, you're, you're covered. So there's a different type of storytelling and they use a lot of like, um, what they used to use thought balloons, but now they'll use captions to explain what's going on, stuff like this. But this guy, he's doing a book, and again, at this, this is such a weird thing. Like, I just I think maybe why the racism was really high against him. I have to believe this is it is that he got to create a book that wasn't a superhero book, that but was in the superhero canon. And he's up here drawing faces and people and, and drawing real situations that are not um, – it's not true IP. Like you come in and you're working at DC, like you're expecting to work on like Batman and Superman and the Flash, stuff like that, and you know Green Arrow and have you. And he's like, I don't want to do that. You know, mm -hmm. he's obviously – I mean, this is lucky at the time that DC is – that what's your name? Jeanette Kahn is allowing DC – like creators to create stuff that's not superhero stuff because there's yes. nothing 
nothing at Marvel at this time in their 80s that is non-superhero. I mean, yes, they have their epic line, so that there is that, but that's epic. That's not under like DC proper. Like this book has got the DC bullet on it, and it's got the meanwhile <laughs> column on it. And yes, it's got, all, and it's got the house ads for like Green Green Lantern and shit like yeah. that. So it's thoroughly ensconced within the the DC universe, and yet he's not doing superhero work. He's doing this kind of pulpy stuff that's kind of pushed to to the limit of what that is. And it's sort of genius that these two guys got to work. Like, I'm so curious to, uh, to get a sense of what Robert Lauren Fleming, in his mind, <laughs> he's saying at the time, I want to do this book. Who do I get? I don't believe that, that no one goes, I'm, that the, oh, he's black and I'm colorblind. He knows he's getting a black artist. You know, he knows mm-hmm. that. And he knows that maybe he's like, here's the only guy that I know who could like, who could go on this crazy journey with me. Because he's probably got to talk to a guy or two and say, hey, what kind of stuff are you into? What do you do? Blah, 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 and go, I'm not going to work with him. Or, you know, he's too caught up in this. He wants to, you know, he wants, because Trevor probably, hey, I want to see some of your work outside of like your sketchbooks, you know? Yeah. I bet you everyone wants to show them sketchbooks of like, heroes they want to draw you know sure. or stuff they don't get to draw and he i he is not doing that i know he's not because look at his work like it doesn't show any sense of like he's like i'm not saying he's too good for superhero stuff because obviously he's done some great superhero stuff that, yeah. green, that green arrow thing the miniseries he did which which he didn't like and, and because yes i'm not saying he didn't like it but i mean his work but it's like He's very clear in the interview you were saying that he was he felt he was given like the scrub team of work to do. You know, because yeah. like, he, he did the Green Arrow when Green Arrow wasn't big, and then he was thrown on doing Black Canary, which is even a step oh, down. Oh yeah, that from, was after that was yeah, after Thriller. Yeah, yeah, which is a step down from, from even Green Arrow, which is just a, a high selling book. And it's just like it's, it's like, you know, this guy's work, it's so like we you just, it's hard to just keep not talking about how inventive it is. Yeah, it's just it's, hard not to because it's, it's just jaw dropping. Uh, I mean, because I, I mean, it's, I think it's a trick that you have to be able to do as anybody who is a interested in art forms, as opposed to just a consumer of entertainment or stuff like that. So you know, like if you go and watch, I remember when we were in our writers group one time. And we were talking uh, about the movie La Strada, the Fellini film, La Strada. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Kat saw it. And she was like, I've seen this movie before. I've seen all the stuff in this movie before. Like, why, why, why is this movie famous? Because like, at the time, in 54, no one had done that. Right. Yeah. And that's why it's a exactly. famous movie. Because the first person to do anything that is a new kind of storytelling or a new form or, or to explore some new sense of our humanity, you know, in arts – that person always gets it, th- those things become iconic. I mean, when people think about, I mean, like there's there's artists who can draw and paint at the level of the masters from the Renaissance today. You know, there's people yeah. who can do that. You know, um, because they've seen that work. But at the time, no. But at the time when Michelangelo was doing the Sistine Chapel, there's no there's no one else who's doing that for him to like borrow from. <laughs> That's true. I, yeah, you know, right. I, he was the first. He was yeah. the first. So he's, he's making it up whole cloth. Like, how do I draw God? Mm-hmm. You know, is what he's saying. Like, how do I draw God on the ceiling? Because God hasn't been depicted that way. So, and I want to do that. And it's like, you know, and plus he's got to get it past the church. It's just like the level of, of true genius. Like, no one's ever seen this before, done this before. How do I do it? Because there's that just a weird jump in art where it's flat for a while, like it's very two dimensional, and then all of a sudden it's not. It's, yeah, it's got the, the, the like the volume that we associate with doing the Renaissance art. But even at the top of the Renaissance, when guys like like Giotto were doing their work, they're still not quite at the level of Michelangelo when he's doing like the the Last Supper and shit like that. And the way he's got the expressions and and the way he's got just like you know like all those little cherubs and shit on the damn Sistine Chapel and, and just everything he's doing. And then you know uh, Da Vinci and this stuff. And that's kind of where you got to put Van Eden's work is that it's like. He's doing stuff that nobody is doing. I mean, I you know, like 
like there's a hint of kind of like uh, you know like some magna like influence in this you know to yeah it's degree. funny it's funny you say manga because i also felt like reading this there were times where just some of the stuff he does were like you know very manga devices that you never saw in mainstream comics at the time but i'm looking at like page 14 in issue one and there's some moments where the character is surprised toward the end of the page and his eyes just become little dots and yeah. they become little dots in a way that no one did in mainstream comics, but it's a very common thing you see in manga. And so, right. yeah, I think Von Eden, I get the sense, was a voracious fan of art. And I think he was looking everywhere. And we should also mention, just talking about Von Eden's early career, that he was actually a very historic figure um, at the beginning of his career, because I'm just looking at his uh, Wikipedia here, but just to make sure I get the dates right. But Trevor was uh, hired when he was 16 years old by DC Comics to illustrate prototype assignments with the Legion of Superheroes and Weird War Tales. And soon after that, he designed and co-created uh, DC's first black superhero to have his own title, Black Lightning. So Trevor Von Eden is credited as the co-creator of Black Lightning along with Tony Isabella. And so he did that when he was a freaking teenager, high school age. And so then from there, he continued working at DC uh, in 77. He began drawing the Green Arrow backup feature in World's Finest Comics, where he co-created the character of Count Vertigo, which, side note, one of the coolest fucking costumes ever in mainstream comics history. If you haven't seen Trevor Von Eden's Count Vertigo, go look it up. It looks dope as shit. Um, amazing design work. Uh, Von Eden. Yeah. Uh, what's that? I just want to say, this is interesting because I knew about Count Vertigo and I knew about uh, um, Black Lightning. I just didn't know a black guy was the co-creator of those. Mm. I did. I mean, like, I, I mean, yeah. that, that like, yeah. like, I understand it. I mean, you always hear about Tony Isabella, Tony Isabella, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that the artist on that was black. And then I didn't know he's probably still in his teens when he's doing this. Oh, which yeah. A, which yeah. again goes back to my comment about he is suffering under the ire of jealousy that is mixed in with I racism. Think, I think he had to be. I think he had to be because he's a 16 year old kid who is so good that he's like a prodigy. He's good enough to be drawing mainstream comics and creating iconic, legendary characters. And so from there, Von Eden, um, he says, this is from an interview with him. He says he worked for Neil Adams concurrently with the, with his DC tenure starting in 78 starting in 78 until somewhere in the late 90s. So, wow, that's crazy. So he's saying he worked with Neil Adams, I guess, on and off for 20 years. He moved to Marvel Comics in 79 and 80, penciled Power Man and Iron Fist and uh, Spider-Woman. His stint at Marvel was cut short because in his own words, he was fired by Jim Shooter, who told me specifically when I first started there to try and draw like Jack Kirby and apparently was not happy that I didn't. Uh, Trevor, Trevor then returned to DC and once again drew Green Arrow in World's Finest uh, and later in Detective Comics as well. In collaboration with writer Mike W. Barr, he crafted the Batman Annual number eight, which uh, that's the one you referenced earlier, Chris, which is right. a stunner, just a an amazing masterpiece of an annual. I think uh, cartoonist Kayfabe just did a, a great breakdown of that annual um, a couple months ago. And so I'd highly recommend that anybody who's interested in everything we're saying about Von Eden, go check out the cartoonist kayfabe, uh, where they talk about Batman annual number eight, which is, I believe colored by none other than Lynn Varley, who, uh, Trevor, I believe was dating at the time as well. So there was all kinds well, we, well, of, all we, kinds well, of stuff yeah. going on. Well, that's the thing that we, you mentioned to me before in one of these interviews, it's like part of why, look, we, we talked about, how he's influencing Miller and Mazzuchelli. And I know that if he was dating Lynn Varley, and I think you had mentioned that she was kind of dating him and also kind of like dating Frank Miller at the same time, or well, there was some kind of weird like triangle going on there. But you can see the artwork jump from Miller's work on Daredevil to when he went to DC to do Ronin. It's like if you look at Von Eden's work, then you look at and you look at those last issues of Daredevil and look at Ronin and you go, how does he make that jump? Where's the like what's yeah. the the, yeah. the etymology of that jump? And it's like, oh, it's Trevor. Yeah, I think, you know, Miller was probably looking at a lot of stuff, but I think you're right, Chris. If I look at Ronan and I think about Von Eden's work, and I know Miller has said, obviously, he's influenced by samurai movies and manga himself, and he's looking at Lone Wolf and Cub and whatever. 
but I also feel like Miller himself wanted Trevor Von Eden to draw Batman year one. And so he's clearly looking at Trevor's work as well. And I'm not saying this, and you think you're not saying it either as a shot at Miller, but it's like he was influenced by Von Eden. He himself, I would imagine, would probably say this if he hasn't already. No, well, I mean, he probably won't because... <laughs> maybe guys, maybe not. No, because guys <laughs> at his level in a field like comics and where he's reached where he is, they don't talk about... Um, who influenced them in their early years. Like most artists, when they get to a certain point, they don't do that. I think the only guy I know who does that is like Steven Spielberg. Like Spielberg, I know he talks a lot about how, um, how he moves the camera, how he does a lot of stuff. He, he's, he, like Spielberg has always said he, that he's a very conservative filmmaker. In terms of like he goes back and watches these older films all the time to find inspiration for what he's doing. Now, granted, he's going to do it through his lens. But I remember he was talking one time when he did um, about this movie called The Best Years of Our Lives. Hmm. And he was like, I watch this movie every year. I try to get my kids to watch it. They don't. I try to get it gives me something every you know, all the time. And he and I was like, I was like and he mentioned and I seen the movie two or three times. At this point, I was watching this interview with him, and it's a dope movie. But he mentioned something that, like, I had never noticed before. He was like, "Oh, it's not till like in the third act that there's even a piece of music in the movie." You know, like, is a is a piece is a is a music. There's no score until it's one heavy dramatic moment in the third act. And I was like, "See, that's fucking smart." To yeah, be able to like. You know, and you got to watch the movie a bunch of times to even pick up on that because right, you don't even notice it. You don't even notice it. You yeah, know? but see, but he's but he is so comfortable with what he's doing that he, you know, c- can make those kind of like like admissions like that. Whereas I don't think someone who in like I think comic art is way more of a uh, uh, like a dog. It's like a dog eat dog yeah, kind dog of business. Dog yeah, people, people don't want to give it up like that. Like they would give too. I mean, when they do. To talk about, I mean, look, who was talking about Jack Kirby when he was alive? You know, they talk about him now, but, you know, but when he was alive, I don't know if they were. You it's, know? I think, I take your point. It's, it's a different sort of tenor that people talk about their peers with. And I think the egos that a lot of artists have make it hard for them to say like, oh yeah, I'm really influenced by this peer over here of mine, which right. und- undoubtedly is true, but you're right. That's why it actually was interesting to me and noteworthy to hear Mazzuchelli in that Amazing Heroes interview uh, calling out Trevor Von Eden as someone he was such a big fan of and being so effusive about him. And I think that probably speaks to just Mazzuchelli being a very secure artist in his own abilities. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's willing to say, like, I fucking love Trevor Von Eden. That's one of my one of my well, influences. Well, yeah, and he's also could say, I got the job that he didn't get. I got yeah. Batman Year One, which which made made my career. And I yeah. and, and no matter what else doesn't matter what else he does. And yep. he doesn't have his, he actually doesn't do a lot. He has, he's, no, he's never he's really got done a lot. A very small, small body of work. I think Mazzuchelli's body of work might be the smallest yet most impactful body of work maybe in mainstream comics. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's like born it's like born again and it's uh Batman Year One and then it's just a few one off issues like that issue of Marvel fanfare with Angel that Ann Nascenti wrote. Oh, it's yeah. such a great issue. Yeah, yeah. And and then he's got Rubber Blanket, which he self published three issues of that are all just stunning, oversized raw magazine format, like giant magazines that are just beautifully printed and expensive as fuck these days. There's, I think there's like a book he did called called like the Polyp Man or something like oh, that. Oh no, um, Asteria, Asterius Polyp. Yeah, yeah, Asterius Asteri- Polyp. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like that's his kind of magnum opus that he did a little later. And then I think the only other real significant Mazzuchelli work I can think of off the top of my head is the Paul Auster City of Glass adaptation he did that I think Paul Karasik uh, wrote or adapted from the Paul Auster book. But that's a really obscure thing that Mazzuchelli did for like a book publisher. But that's also beautiful. And really, that's I think that's mostly it in terms of Mazzuchelli's major work in comics, you know, and, uh, you know, that's a very small body of work. But God damn, he casts a huge shadow and he's obviously a brilliant artist. And I I think the thing about Mazzuchelli's work, the uh, the difference is 
it's you know what he got to do batman year one and i think that there's nothing that trevor did that had that impact and it's apparent he says because of the racism i mean he's telling you you know i i I, look if he's working at marvel and jim shooter's telling him to draw like fucking um jack kirby i think that but see you always gotta wonder about this stuff going on Mm -hmm. both jim shooter and trevor von eden were these phenoms who got to work professionally in their teens you know and i wonder shooter does he feel threatened by this guy, you know, who's a little more of a yeah. like exciting artist? He got because because I, I, who did Jim Shooter ever create? Did he create any characters? I think he might have created some characters, maybe for the Legion of Superheroes. Um, I don't know. I don't know that he's created any significant characters that are that member. He might have carried. I think he might have created a couple characters in the Avengers, maybe, but I don't know that there's anyone like massive that he certainly not a character i don't think as big as black lightning as black lightning or count yeah. vertigo yeah or count you know? vertigo even probably so yeah it's so i mean it's i mean it's it's something about this guy's work and it's just i'm so curious because he's the contemporary of of dennis cowan right yes he's, yeah he I, th- young- I think they're cont- yeah i think they are contemporaries because dennis started also like what in the late 70s early 80s, early 80s yeah yeah I think Von Eden he's probably, might... He's probably like, I've, Von Eden's probably four or five years older than him. That's what I was going to say. I think Von Eden preceded Dennis just by a few years. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting you brought up that he worked for uh, Neil Adams and Continuity for 20 years. Because I, I know that Continuity... Because I don't know the last book that Neil Adams like penciled monthly, right? So that's an art studio that's, yeah. doing, gra- that's doing graphic art. That's doing commercial art. And I feel like the reason why Trevor's work, I bet, I bet he was like, you know what? Fuck comics. I'm going to just do this work because it's more money for me to do work at, for mm-hmm. Jim Shooter, you know? Um, and, and not deal with the bullshit kind of egos and stuff like that because it's something we had said. Who was saying this? Ta-Nehisi Coates was saying in an interview recently about why he – he that he needs to write Superman and needs to write Captain America hmm. is that he was saying that that there the, the people believe in those myths. Those myths have a lot of power to them. The Superman and with the Nietzsche shit and everything like that. And he was like, he's like, you can't let white people only tell those stories because it it, it denies the rest of the population, which is the which is greater population, yeah. planet wide. Yep. And he's like, he, he was like, it, it's important for me to get in there and be part of the one, help tell stories with these iconic characters from a different point of view. That you know, and that's more inclusive in terms of a lot of things. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm assuming that his Superman movie is with a black Superman. You know, I'm assuming I, it is. I think. Yeah, you know. I believe. I believe so. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I, from, what, from what I've heard. To, yeah, because he, he's doing that because he's like, we can't keep telling the myth that the only heroes available are yeah. white men. We just can't. Yeah. We can't have that. And that's important. And I feel like this, you know, it's, I mean, look, there's outside of data, there's nobody black in Thriller. You know, I mean, and, and, and Cracker Jack is, is Latinx, but it's still a majority white kind of like team and stuff like that. But he's able to make the most out of it. It's interesting because I, th- I think I mentioned this on the question um, po- the episode in the question, how Dennis was very particular how he draws black people. Yeah, you did. And I actually thought that was one of the coolest observations um, that uh, was made in that episode, because I thought like looking back at those question issues, you were so correct because it was not just at all the same cookie cutter face. Like, as you pointed out, so many artists in comics were doing for the quote unquote black character. It would be the same template, but Dennis Dennis did not do that at all. No. And, 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 and neither does Trevor because He's got black people in here every once in a while. Like I think in like episode issue one, there's like a, a thug who like gets touched by white by white satin, right? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's on like page uh, 13 and 14. You know, and this guy looks so different. He looks so different than, than Data. Oh, yeah. Oh, totally different. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, and that's great. And that really is what a great comic artist should do. And that's what you feel like Trevor is doing in every case. He's actually drawing. He's not just kind of repeating a formula for any of these characters or for any of the page layouts. Trevor feels like he's in there just drawing every single page, figuring out the best way to to you know compose something or to illustrate a person or a sequence. There's no cookie cutter templates with Von Eden. And it's really just so impressive. And and here, um, just on the note of what we were talking about, um, a couple things. I, I found a, a cool little blog post that talks in a little bit more detail about Trevor passing on Batman Year One. And so this is from a, a blog called uh, odannyboy.blogspot.com. And so he's got an article here that says, Batman Year One, Frank Miller and Trevor Von Eden. Okay, and this is a blog post from 2009. And so just to read the first part of this here, it says everyone who has a passing interest in comic books knows the name Frank Miller. And if they don't know the name David Mazzuchelli, then they should. Uh, Together, Miller and Mazzuchelli created two of the finest story arcs of the mid 80s, first with their run on Daredevil and the Born Again storyline and with the classic Batman Year One, a story that redefined the mythos of the character and is still referenced and held as a benchmark today. Uh, Much like Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' Watchmen, Batman Year One will more than likely never be out of print for DC. Uh, It sells in numbers still today. What isn't widely known is that Mazzuchelli was not the first choice of artist on the series. Despite working with Mazzuchelli at Marvel and creating one of the best series within a series seen there for decades, talking about Born Again, Mm -hmm. Miller, Miller approached a different artist to work on Batman Year One, Trevor Von Eden. At the time, Von Eden was working off and on at DC and producing some of the most expressionistic Batman stories ever seen. This was a time where Jim Aparo's style was being adopted almost as a house style. Yet Von Eden, frustrated by the constraints of working within both his own limitations and what DC expected of him, began to break loose, resulting in the now famous Batman Annual number 8, published in 82. Says Trevor, About three years into my career... At about the age of 20, I started to feel that I'd only gotten the job, um, I think he means in comics, uh, because of my skin color, a notion which displeased me greatly. So I dedicated myself wholeheartedly to, to developing my art to a point where it would be so good that it wouldn't matter what color I was. I think he's talking specifically about getting the job to co create Black Lightning. I think that's probably, what he's talking about. Probably, yeah, for probably. he's saying he thought it was because of his skin color. And so so I dedicated myself to developing my art to a point where I would be so good that it wouldn't matter what color I was. I sat down and wrote a five-page mission statement, now lost, <laughs> writing out for myself in detail exactly what I wanted to create, the kind of style I thought would express myself most effectively, while also telling a story in the most dramatic way possible. I wrote everything down that I could think of, the details, form, and purpose of style of art that I'd wanted to create. Out of these two long years of serious effort, I created the art style scene in the Batman Annual, which is an absolute stunner of a book. And by the way, I think I've read elsewhere that Von Eden calls that still the single piece of comic art that he was most satisfied with, at least in the realm of mainstream comics in his entire career. And he felt like that was like the apex of work for him, colored by Lynn Varley. Um, He was just thrilled with it. And it is an exquisite, exquisite piece of work. So from there, uh, Trevor worked sporadically on the character of Batman, both in the Batman title proper and in other DC comics. Personal circumstances, personal circumstances saw his life intertwine with Frank Miller's. And though... It was after Von Eden turned in yet another sterling job on Batman, this time in issue 401, Miller approached him with the offer to pencil year one, which would begin in Batman 404. So this is interesting. Um, So Von Eden did a fill-in job on Batman in issue 401. Okay, so Batman year one was published in the regular Batman title, starting in issue 404. Right, So so that is really interesting, right? Like Trevor was right there. And so here's a quote from Trevor. Frank had called me in person to offer me the Batman year one job before giving it to Mazzuchelli. I said, no, says Trevor, and I have no regrets. Dave did a beautiful job. 
His wife, Richmond, Richmond Lewis, colored it too. And it's true. Mazzuchelli and Richmond Lewis obviously did just a stunning job on Batman Year One. Everyone agrees. Masterpiece. All that. Sadly, we may never know what would have been if Von Eden had accepted the Batman Year One job. Certainly, his art at the time was head and shoulders above other artists. And he has been cited as an influence on artists that have come since. Even Mazzuchelli has sang his praises. Recently, Mazzuchelli had this to say about Von Eden's 80s work. Quote, I'd like to think that something of what excited me on those pages found its way into Batman Year One, but my own work from back then seems mighty tame next to Mr. Von Eden's. So that's a quote from Mazzuchelli. Again, very humble of Mazzuchelli to really give it up to Von Eden and to speak like that publicly. And like we said, that's not something you hear great artists doing that often, comparing their own work unfavorably to their peers. Um, Norm, Bre- Norm Brayfogle, who is another classic Batman artist, rest in peace, another amazing artist. Norm Br- Brayfogel, who would soon be drawing his own unique vision of Batman, had this to say recently. Quote, I've been a fan of Trevor's work since his first Batman annual job, so much so that I would say he's one of my influences. So there you go again. Norm, giving it up to Trevor. So Von Eden has returned to Batman more than once since the mid 80s. Each time his art has taken on a new dimension and he's shown that he's not stuck in any one style. Alas, we'll never know what Batman year one might have looked like uh, if penciled by Trevor Von Eden. But, you know, we can we can imagine. So so there is a little little background and. You know, Trevor doesn't get into the details there of why he passed on the gig. I don't know if it necessarily had to do. I don't recall if he's said in interviews before if it had to do with any of the the personal drama going on with the fact that he was dating Lynn Varley first. And then after that, Frank and Lynn started dating. And I don't know if that played a role in in why Trevor chose to pass on Batman year one. That's certainly possible. But regardless, I would say that it is. I would say that it is because. By the time they're doing Batman Year One, which I, which which everyone forgets was not a standalone book, it was within the the the, the, the regular counting of that the regular issues. I would hazard to guess that Trevor and Lynn are dating when Trevor is in his early twenties. Yeah, right? a few I think years so. later, a few years later, when she's with Miller, because. They go on to do like that Electra saga or whatever is the Electra, you know. Like, I mean, she does. Look, well, she does. Well, she does Dark Knight. I mean, she does Dark Knight. She does his Electra book. Mm-hmm. I think she does um, think Ronan. This, yeah, I think so. Um, so if I feel like they probably broke up, right? And, and then it's probably because because he does Batman Year One after he does Dark Knight, right? I believe that. I believe yeah, that is true. It's yeah. After. So it's yeah. probably like four or five years later after the breakup, and. And 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 Miller's probably saying, well, you know, it's it, it's it's been it's been it's been enough time for that kind of like that wound of the heart to heal. So I'm gonna ask you to do this, not because I mean I bet I mean is, is, I, I wonder if, if if there's some sort of weird jealousy. Is, is it look like you're, oh you're throwing me a bone to work you like under you, but you took my girl. I mean like there's all this kind of weird stuff that you know is beyond. Yeah. Just because if he yeah. if he because if he did the pencils, you know what? I probably have, I probably have the Batman what four hundred one? You said it was that he did. Yeah, I that's right. Have, I, see, I probably have that because I remember I remember that's when I was reading Batman, and I, um, and, and you know at the time I just picked up Batman Year One because it was the next issue in the thing. You know, was, right? Oh, you picked it just like that, yeah. Yeah, because it was like because at the time like. Nobody knew what that was going to be, you know. Yeah, of course, it, it was. It was, it, there was no internet for the people to be like advanced pubbing. Like, oh, there's this new Frank Miller Batman thing he's doing with the guy did with with, with the guy that fucking did uh, uh, the Born Again because it had been at least four or five years since Born Again, you know. Because because Born Again, I guess he'd come back to do Born Again after uh after Ronan, maybe. I don't remember what the dates are. But it had been a while since he had done Bone again before he did Batman Year One. And it's like bring that team back together, you know, was is interesting. Um it's yeah. interesting you also said that he said that he didn't like this thing about being the skin color. I think it's very 
I'll speak for myself. It's hard to be an artist when you're working in a medium like comics. You know, if he was like a, a painter or something like that, he wouldn't have that statement about, oh, he might, depending on what type of art that he's doing. But when you work in comics, when you work in Hollywood, and you're black, what you really want to do is you is that you want to be seen not as the black artist. You want to be seen as the artist who's black. Right. You know, and it's a very nuanced thing, but it's like the difference is, is that it feels like to other people that it's like, I don't get to do, is that like, I don't get to be seen to do anything else except for the black work. I think that's what he's saying is like, if they hired me and a kid to do these, like they said, prototype work, and they finally got me on to do black lightning, I bet you there was like, he feels now he's in a ghetto and he feels like, I don't get to do Flash. I don't get to do Superman. I don't get to do Aquaman. I don't get right. to do these, are super, you know, like the big stuff except for the fill-in stuff. Yeah, you know. And I, in his head, I mean, I, it's, it's a discussion that so many black like screenwriters that I know that I have and some directors. It's like, you know, I mean, there's some who are cool to be like, hey, I want to stay in that black space and tell our stories and all the other kind of stuff like that. But particularly people who do like genre and stuff like that, or just anything, you say to yourself, you know, I want to do something else. You know, it's like, I, I mean, I some somebody had asked me one time, why did I write that Orson Welles movie that I wrote? You know? Right. Because it's like, why would you write a story about Orson Welles when there are other, I mean, as someone said, as opposed to Oscar Michelle. And I was like, well, I know Oscar Michelle's work. It's, it's, it's important but it wasn't yeah. inspiration. It wasn't inspiration yeah. to me. Well, and like implicit in that question to you, I imagine, is sort of the the judgment or like sort of the the idea of like, well, you should have written about this other person, you know? Like, yeah. like you yeah. you had a responsibility in with the opportunities you have in Hollywood to, you know, only write stories about, you know, these this group of people. It's like and I think some people think of it that way. And I've I've gotten similar feedback at times where people are like, you're Armenian American. Why? Why haven't you written about the Armenian genocide? Why haven't you written a story about the genocide? Why haven't why are you writing stories about other things? Blah, blah, blah. You should only be focused on getting that done. And people don't realize there's like a complex sort of tapestry of things going on when you're trying to build a career in the creative arts. And a lot of times you're trying to get a whole lot of projects going. And just because like, you know, you get a foothold on one or one comes out first doesn't mean you're not trying to do other things. And just because you decide to tell a story about one person doesn't mean you're not also going to tell a story about another five or 10 people. It's like, it's not either or, but I think sometimes from the outside looking in, people just want to pass judgment on one piece of work that they happen to see you did. But, you know, Chris, that same person who asked you that question, they probably didn't know what the other, you know, 10 or 15 scripts you'd written, you know, in that five year period were about <laughs> like, they don't know right. everything you're doing. You might also be writing all these other stories. And, you know, it's like, it's just one of those things. that's like a personal choice for an artist. We all, we all come from different ethnic groups and we all feel like whatever responsibility or desire we do to tell stories featuring, you know, that group. But I think as an artist, like, I don't know, for me to speak personally, I didn't get into being a writer because I wanted to tell stories about Armenian Americans who were born in New York, but then raised mostly in Southern California because like that's my experience. And I want to speak directly to that. Like I wanted to tell stories about everybody and everybody that like that I find inspiring or interesting. Well, there is that there's that for sure. But it's also the thing. It's like you probably saw some movies that were like, fuck, that's a cool movie. I want to do movies. <laughs> yeah, right. Totally. You know, yeah. that, that that didn't have an Armenian in it, or for me, didn't have a black person in it. Or for Trevor, he's looking at comics, and he's, he might have seen Batman when he was a kid and was like, I want to do comics. Mm -hmm. You know, there. I mean, when he's a kid, there's no black There's no black superheroes. Maybe maybe Black Panther is, I don't know. Yeah, yeah Black Panther's probably around. Because Trevor, if he was 16. Yeah, Black Panther was definitely around. Yeah, because that's must have been ten. He must have been yeah. around nine or ten when Black Panther came around. Maybe a little eight, eight, nine or ten. Mm -hmm. So he's got one black character to look at, you know. And uh, but what's interesting that you say that he says, um, 
you know, the seventies is a weird time, obviously in, in comics in, in, in media in general, because this civil rights movement is over and there are white people who are in these positions of to, you know, to change your life and give you an opportunity to work in a field you want to work in who aren't evil, you know, and mm. obviously, and obviously Neil Adams is not an evil white person. No, because we, because we know he's working with Dennis Cowan. We know he's working with Trevor Von Eden and we know he's working with, with like Larry Hama. Yeah. So, so, so those are three people of color yep. who became like, you know, some luminaries in the comic industry. And I, I mean, I'm curious if, I'd be curious to ask Neil Adams, did you take any shit? Oh yeah. People that's, that's a great you question. Yeah. Because you work with black people. Because yeah. I know that's a conversation that other white people have with other white people is that you hired a black dude. Why? Yeah. You know? And Neil was such a badass artist and such just, you know, like a top of the fucking heap artist. Like he was he was the man in terms of mainstream comics art and just radically changing the game. He was so confident in his own skill and what he did. I imagine Neil Adams is, is the kind of person who never really gave a fuck what anyone was saying about him or thought about him. Like Neil seems like he's always had a very secure sense of his own skill set and his abilities. And here in this interview with the comics journal, Trevor talks about Neil specifically and Trevor speaks to the same idea uh, where Michelle Fife in the journal interview asks Trevor, um, and a question about Neil Adams kind of, or that leads into this. Um, and we should give a shout out to Michelle Fife who did this uh, journal interview and is a brilliant cartoonist in his own right, because it's Michelle Fife's, uh, work in celebrating Trevor Von Eden, which makes up a good amount of the interviews and articles online that you can find about Trevor right now that are the most, uh, really thorough breakdowns, interviews, analyses of his work. So I'd encourage everyone to go search Trevor Von Eden, Michelle Fife, and Fife has done an incredible job of celebrating Von Eden's work because he also is a massive fan and uh, just loves the work. So well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's hard not to be a fan. Of this yeah. <laughs> Thank God Fife's put all this stuff out there. Cause I think I stumbled across one of these Fife interviews with Trevor some years ago. And I was like, what the fuck? This work is amazing. How did I not? How did I not notice how brilliant Von Eden was at the time? I mean, I remember Von Eden doing a fill-in on an issue of Batman and the Outsiders, and that issue in itself is another just absolute fucking just masterpiece of a fill-in issue, and it looks like nothing else DC was publishing at the time. And he did a bunch of backups on Batman and the Outsiders, like maybe a handful, and all of those are just incredible work, just really, really incredible. Anyways, he's got, so, he's got keep going, but I'm keep going. I'm, okay, I'm okay, going okay, you, yeah. So the Fife thing here, though, Fife says to Trevor, did you have studio mates or any peers who influenced your work ethic or your work rather and your work ethic? How strong was the sense of camaraderie for you back in those days? And Trevor responds, sense of camaraderie? You mean every man for himself? That's about it. As far as I could tell back then, didn't bother me. You don't need a sense of camaraderie to become an artist, uh, but a codependent. You need a sense of self to be an artist. Meeting Neil, meeting Neil Adams in 78 and working for him doing advertising work while drawing Black Lightning was the strongest and the most important influence on my work and my work ethic. As an artist and professional, Neil is impeccable. I learned just by being around him. It was all very zen. He didn't teach. I learned. Neil's become somewhat infamous for his brutal honesty in some circles. Those are the people I like to call jealous assholes. Because of jealous assholes in every facet of your life and career, they exist simply to destroy what they cannot create. They lurk sometimes even in the hearts of those closest to you. They fade in the light of independence. My life is simple. I yearn to find the truth in any and every case. Those who consider brutal honesty to be a bad thing are people with whom I never choose to waste my time. I'm too damn busy finding out something important. That's what life is for. So Trevor, Trevor's a really fascinating fellow, and he clearly is someone who was thinking very deeply about his work, and he saw the work he was doing as a mission and a calling just as much as any kind of a job. And I think you can feel how much spirituality and just 
how much of his soul is in this work. And I thought it was really interesting, the thing earlier that Trevor said about how he wrote a mission statement, a five-page mission statement for himself about how far he wanted to push his art and the form of comics and the kind of things he wanted to explore. Like To hear about that kind of conscious and really profound intentionality from a young artist who is literally putting down a five-page, like, you know, Jerry Maguire style mission statement, like this is the shit that I want to do with my work and putting it down on paper to really think about it deeply. That's not something a lot of young artists do. And so it really points to like the level of intentionality that Trevor was bringing to his work. So when we can sit here gushing about Thriller and it sounds like, you know, what we're saying can't possibly be true. The work can't be this good. Like it really is that good. And the reason it's good is because these are all intentional choices being made by a young genius artist who is taking these incredibly ambitious swings and trying to create something new. And it's just so rare that an artist with that much talent is in a position to push themselves and really throw work out there at this level to a mainstream audience. And sadly, it's not something that is sustainable quite often. But, you know, like these days, I just appreciate when any work of that level gets out there at all. And and I think it really, when you read the interviews with Trevor, it really becomes clear why he was able to produce work of this level. Yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's, there's an interesting, there's, there's a sense of bitterness in his interviews, but I feel like he's made a point where it's like it's doggy dog, and it's like you gotta have a sense of self, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about you can't admit where people they've drawn they've drawn influence from. Because that means that you don't have a grasp on on what you're trying to do. The mission statement is fascinating, because yeah, I I, I very much want to see some of this work he did, this this the world's finest like stuff he did with with Green Arrow before Thriller, because Thriller again, like I said, like he's not. This is new. Like there's no like I'm not doing Green Arrow. I'm not doing Black Lightning. I'm not doing Batman. I'm doing yes. my. Sh- I'm doing my shit. Yep. And when you get to do your shit, you kind of like, like you said, it's like it's soulful. Like he's bleeding. Like he's pouring his soul into every fucking page in a way that is. I mean, I think I was gonna tell you is like so in issue two, no issue three, which has one of the dopest covers of all the things. Oh, of, yeah. of all these fucking amazing things. cover. But. On issue page eight, right? It's just some subtle shit that he does. So we're talking about how he does like the shadows and stuff like that. The page eight on this guy's face, he's using that zip tone stuff to do the shadows, right? Hmm. But 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 it's only in these two panels. The rest of the book does not have the zip tone, and it's just like I just want to do that real quick. You said earlier how like, he just throws oh yeah. Away Oh, Something you're right. Yeah. Yes. Go, Bam. I'm not going to do that on the next page because I don't want to do that. Yes, so you're the, totally right. There's no more on zip next, tone. On the next, yeah. But on the <laughs> next page, here's what's cool on the next page, right? See now on the, like, like those bottom four panels. Uh-huh. Look at the geographic shape. Yeah, what the, the fuck is in. going on? Wild. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's. Cr- I mean, I, I, I'm so, the cartoonist K Fabe guys would do this, and 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 they had to do a three part episode. Oh because yeah, they would be going crazy. It would. I mean, I think we you know, we mentioned before how like Dick Giorgiano like did some of the inking on this, and I think this is part of like he'd been losing faith in the book and all this kind of stuff. And but like by the time that but you'd mentioned to me offline that that he didn't draw these pages. At the normal at, at the comic yes the comic artist pages he drew them at the size you're gonna be printed at right that's Which is true fucking bizarre <laughs> and crazy ass shit but I think there's those is it, is, it, is it six or seven or something like that six or seven where it's inked by Dick Giordano that's right he does and, two he think he does two issues he comes yeah, on board and, and I feel like it's too much for Dick Giordano to do as the inker he's like I can't. I, he's like, I, I can't do this work. Yeah, I don't I, I, like I don't like the Giordano issues as much as the Trevor issues. They're not bad. They still look really dope overall. But Giordano adds a little bit of that polish that Trevor doesn't do on his work. And I mean, he still is. I'm sure he's being somewhat fidelitous. It still looks like Trevor. But I do wonder, 
Like, I wonder if Giordano came on because Trevor was feeling like his enthusiasm had been killed. And so he was like suddenly behind schedule on the book because he was just kind of bummed about the way things were going on behind the scenes and all the disrespect and the racism and all that he was dealing with. I wonder if he was behind schedule and Giordano came on because of that. Or I wonder if Giordano just felt like Trevor's finishes were too rough and not polished enough or something for DC at the time, if they were if they were getting complaints by the upper management or the people who were more square and conventional and traditional, and they thought this book doesn't look finished, it looks too rough, Giordano, you got to go clean it up. I have no idea, but I'd be really curious to find out. Because uh, because Dick's inking to me does feel respectful of Trevor. It doesn't feel like he's trying to redraw the book, but it also doesn't have quite the same energy and life as Trevor inking right. himself. Well, yeah, I mean, like there's the, the like the, the the way he'll do hair and the kinetics in some of the panels. You see that it's like there's just simple stuff. Is not it, it's it's issue six and seven are the ones that the Giordano inks. Um, but I also feel that it might be that he's. I mean, I, it's an interesting question to ask him. What's yeah. going on? Because was it, it is issue five is the one that has some of the that has like one of the most brilliant two panel spreads in this entire book, in these entire eight issues. Mm. It's the one where the the guy, um, Edward, who's like the husband of Thriller, writes her that letter, and it's like all quiet, like there's no, and that one page is like. You know, like he writes it to her and, you know, he goes to sleep and then it oh, comes yes. back to life. Yes. You know, with the black panel background and it kind of, it's just like, the, like there's a level, like you mentioned expressionistic, or there's a level that this, like we always talk about how the, the epitome, I mean, the apex of doing great comic art is... I don't need any thought balloons. I don't need any dialogue. I don't need any caption to tell the story. Yeah. It's like those silent issues of like G.I. Joe or the East of West and stuff like that. Yep. These two pages, 19 and 20 in issue five, where this, it's like, we talk about, obviously about the emotionality of this guy's work. Yeah. This is like, where he's putting it on full display. Yeah. It's 19 and and 20 and also 21. Yeah, 21. Yeah, he's putting it on full display in a way that is... See, and this looks a lot like Mage. Like, mm. like these faces and these head shapes is what is what Matt Wagner was studying. This predates Grindel and Mage. And this is what he's looked at this and is going, I know how to do the work that I want to do now. But Trevor does it in a way... Because this... Like, look, like... This three-page spread, like if you look at page 19, right, background is all white, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. that's the dude, Edward, who's writing it. And that's when it's granted in reality. Page 20 is when the is, is when thriller Angie, she like she crosses over with the, the – this is where because magical realism, she's, she's writing on the letter back to him, background is all black. Yes. And then when it's, you know, just dope. And, and then it's black again on page 21 when he's awake, but he's reading it for her and he feels that double heartbeat. It's like what this guy's doing, storytelling wise, what he's doing with the page, what he's doing with the panel, how, how he's using the black, how he's using the white is it's on another level. And it's just, I mean, we had said he's unsung and he's, he's, it's not as like unsung is actually the, is, is, is too tame of a word i don't even know what the word is to say about this guy's like why he's not why he's not just he's not just he's not like he's not properly lauded yes it's the the icon that he he should have been and i mean look like we said like Madison Shelley didn't do a lot of work this guy didn't need to have he didn't need to be a dollar he didn't need to have done a lot of work for people to love this guy and be inspired by him because i look at these pages and i'm like i've seen this work and other people, this type of stuff later, five, ten years later. And I know that comic artists, just like me and you, they trade comics and go, oh, have you seen this book that no one's <laughs> yeah. talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can see this from the – no yeah. about. And it's just I – mean, I mean, this is such a beautiful – like what he's doing emotionally for this part of the story, again, this is something that wouldn't go into most comics because 
it's got, it's got no superhero like like plotting. It's solely about a pretty much like a like a second tier character in the story. Is getting three pages about his lost love, who is the title character, but it's still from his point of view. So it's kind of like a it's a weird place to go with the, with the writing of the story. But he kind of just elevates it to this piece of like poetry that is a little unheard of for comics e- comics even now. Yeah. You know, like 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 comics aren't this poetic. And yeah. Yeah, this guy's amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> po- amazing. <laughs> Poetry is a great word, Chris, to describe what Trevor and Robert Lauren Fleming are doing here. And I feel uh, like we're not mentioning Robert Lauren Fleming that much. Um, although I do want to say that I feel like Robert Lauren Fleming was doing very progressive ahead of his time work absolutely with some amazing ideas here in Thriller. And it is highly creative original work that I think does give Trevor a terrific canvas to work with and to play with. And the only thing I would say about Fleming's work is I feel like it's just it's not quite as fully formed in the writing as Trevor's work is in the art. And so if we're not talking about Fleming as much, it's just that I don't know how to even characterize or talk about the storytelling other than to say, I do think it's also ahead of its time. And, and like you said earlier, like what Robert Lauren Fleming is doing here is so the opposite of what Chris Claremont and so many mainstream comics writers were doing at this time, which is overwriting and having the writing be overly didactic on the nose and just like uh, expository, like repeating itself and just having tons and tons of words. Fleming is more of a minimalist, almost to a fault where he's using so few words for these crazy concepts and stories and character dynamics that it does make the work. It makes the work. I don't want to say impenetrable, but I can imagine why to the average comic fan weaned on the comics of the day, this was an absolute sort of like a, a neutron bomb of originality. And speaking to that, let I just want to read a, a couple lines from an issue of the comics journal the comics journal number 93 which has swamp thing on the cover and it's from yeah i think it's come out this issue came out in 83 or 84 and it's a review of thriller from that exact time when it was published and the review is written by heidi mcdonald heidi mcdonald legendary comics journalist who now runs the beat and uh she's been around comics for a very long time she must have been very young Right. What's the beat? What's the beat? Why the, do I know that? The comics website, uh, just the oh, com- yeah. comics beat. Yeah. Um, and so Heidi's been around comics forever, though. She wrote for Amazing Heroes, the Comics Journal. And so I think this was very early in her comics journalism career. And she wrote a really fascinating review of Thriller here. So I just want to read a few lines from this. Heidi says, Thriller is the love it or loathe or loathe it book of the year. It's been called dumb pretentious, indecipherable, and ugly. Unfortunately, those who like it have not advanced very detailed reasons for their support. I think this is partly because of Thriller's very nature. It is a comic book that has to be felt, and the feelings it engenders are not very easy to describe. So this is fascinating, Chris, because you and I are talking about this, you know, and like like I was saying earlier, it sounds like we're talking around this thing. We're making it sound like it's a psychedelic drug trip, but it's crazy to read this Heidi McDonald interview from back then. And she's kind of arriving at a similar place with how difficult it is to talk about this book. So she goes on to say few, if any, mainstream comics have ever been as deliberately baffling in their form. Is there substance behind Thriller's style? Is experimentation for its own sake worth it? I think the answer to both questions is yes. Thriller is hallucinatory, a completely subjective experience, creating a unique worldview. It has no structure in the usual sense and little plot. Powerful concepts abound in Robert Lauren Fleming's minimalist stories. The relations of God and man, of home, memory, and family and mostly the nature of love. But in the end, these concepts simply aren't harnessed to a story or theme that transcends the deliberate obscurity. I like Thriller very much, but it never crosses the final barrier of its self-consciousness to expression 
which cuts, it never crosses the final barrier of its self-consciousness to expression which cuts clear to the heart, although many times it comes breathtakingly close. It is very novelistic, and like a novel, it is hard to define what thriller is and what it is about. Most of the credit and blame for thriller's excesses belong to Trevor Von Eden, the Robin Yount of comics. And Robin Yount, what is that a reference to? Do you get that reference? I don't know, but I'm going to look that up as you keep reading. Cause okay. It sounds like an artist. Robin Yount. Um, I feel like maybe a musician. I don't know. Who's Robin Yount? Um, Trevor has undertaken one of the most fascinating experiments in comics history by attempting to totally subjectify every episode of the book so that the reader feels it exactly as the characters do. It's pure expressionism. Even the simplest conversation takes on the aspect of a bizarre, life-threatening situation. Panels take the place of the subconscious. So this is amazing because Heidi's talking about so much stuff here. And actually, this is beautifully written, what she's saying. Um, I love that Heidi is giving this the full kind of serious reckoning that the work deserves and that she's saying that what Trevor's undertaken is one of the most fascinating experiments in comics history, attempting to totally subjectify every episode of the book. So the reader feels it exactly as the characters do. Uh, that's, that's a pretty amazing description of what's going on here. Uh, did you find I out? Mean, did you find out who Robin Yount was? If it's, if it's Robin Yount, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, uh, he's a baseball player. Oh shit. <laughs> is that a baseball reference? Heidi McDonald. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's wild. Sh shortstop and a center fielder for the, the Mil for the Milwaukee Brewers. The, the Robin, for, with the Robin Yount of years. comics. Okay, well, we don't get that reference. Maybe someone can uh, explain that to I us. I don't really get that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm just okay. looking at this thing. But it's here's the thing about what she's saying, you know, we, and we and we keyed in on this earlier. It's the book is so emotional, and it's it's kind of weird that there is no story. There's a story, but it, but it's so it's like there's, there's the a plot is really like the c spot in this. So you get so 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 you got to follow it and you can read it and understand it. But it's like it's it's weird to do storytelling where you do things like that where you move what is traditional like the a plot and move it someplace else in the pecking order because it, then it makes the story have to do something different. And but it still has the but the a plot is still pulling the story because that's what's like driving everybody's action per se. You know, remember I wrote this this pilot and I did that the TV pilot and some people loved it because it was like oh it's really cool that's really smart but they were like but but no one's gonna air this because it's really just a procedural but it but but it was kind of like it was an anti procedural. Wait, which pilot was this that you wrote? It's a, it's called Trouble with Girls. I think it's oh you, like, oh yeah yeah part of it. You never yes. read the whole thing, right? When I finished it, and I and I had like my I had some people look at it. and They were like, "This is fucking cool because you did something where you took the a plot and pushed it to the C story." Mm. You know, in terms of it's there, and, and and everyone comes together, and you got to solve this. You know, it's the the procedural element doesn't drive. It drives the story, but it's like in first gear. And what the meat of the story is like what you would do in like a, you know, like in a more like premium cable thing where it's like, what are these people doing and what's their relationships and how much they're struggling with each other and what's going on and stuff like that. Because that to me, I thought would be cool. And I was like, well, but it's like, but you do stuff like that and you're, you're bucking convention in a way that is difficult for, you have to really take a gamble on it. And yeah. Obviously the people behind this are like, yeah, they're taking a gamble because they're like, you know, and, and and we, Steve and I, that is, are asking you, the listeners, to take a gamble on this book. Like you got to buy it. Because oh yeah, it's cheap. It's it's, yeah. You, you, yeah. it's quarter bin books probably. Yep. You know, if not, it's a dollar. Um, and you just get eight issues, and it will like really fascinates you. I don't know if when she, if I believe Heidi McDonald's reference that, um, the excesses are all. Trevor Von Eden's because because <laughs> yeah. yeah you're he's, right because he's writing from a script like yeah or he's drawing know, he's drawing from a script yeah from a script like yeah. it's not it's not like this is a book that's like you know the <laughs> the old it's, it's not like this is like like a like a Jack Kirby Stan Lee special yeah where they yeah. go hey you know what's gonna happen like like Stan says that and then Jack does everything and then Stan Jack comes in and <laughs> Jack goes and does all the work yeah, yeah and then Stan comes and just writes dialogue like there's no way a book like this could work like that yeah. You know, yeah, or punches up much, dialogue. 
yeah, yeah. it's just like you know like like what is um i mean she makes an interesting comment about it doesn't quite it, and you're right oh, look i'm not going to disagree with you or her or the readers yeah. i'm not going to say that this is the book that you're going to read and be like this is the new comics bible for me right you know like, like this is storytelling at the highest level it's not that but by far means not that sto- I, like in terms of robert Roy fleming you know he took a a serious gamble that didn't quite pay off because obviously he gets fired from the book or quits the book at issue seven and it's indicative by all the the stuff in the letter columns where alan gold is just like apologizing and so much and it's the people craziest who are, shit the craziest letter the, column pe- the letter column is the fucking most insane letter column i've ever seen in comics like you say that's alan yeah. gold alan gold just fucking throws the creative team under the bus more and more every issue it's the most insulting offensive performance by an editor in a letters column i've ever seen where from early on he's apologizing for the book and like urging people to criticize it more and more in the letter column. It's insane. It really kind of points to all the turmoil that was going on behind the scenes and, you know, why Fleming and Von Eden just could not keep doing this book. Well, this is something that this is what Alan Gold says in issue three, this top of the letter column. It takes no great powers of observation to detect the singularity, not to say the weirdness of the world of thriller. Now he goes in the parentheses. Many a dedicated reader has by now countered that it does take careful and enthusiastic observation to get the most out of this comic. And that's the fun of it. So be it. It's like he can't believe that people are actually enjoying his book. <laughs> yes. And he gets more and more hostile with every passing issue toward his own creative team. Yeah. He's really tripping. He's really tripping. He says, uh, he says uh, I'm giving the soapbox over to Bob so that he can say a few words about uh, the word he had ever dreamed up. Never the shy one. He's come up with, with plenty of straightforward prose. Uh, let us serve as a map, if you will, for this rugged, surprising terrain. Alan. It's like he can't. It's. I mean, I have to say, though, in his defense, yeah. if I was the editor of this book, I'd be like, what the fuck did y'all do me? <laughs> What's going on here? What the fuck did y'all give me? I understand that, but you can't. I mean, that was one of the more pleasant letter columns, but you can't You can't get out there publicly and rip your team. I, I, I agree with you privately. I understand as an editor, he would be having these concerns, of course, but you can't get out there in the letter column. And like some of these later columns, it's... It's just nutty. It's nutty what he actually says about the book, and I'll see if we can find some of them to to share later. But um, oh yeah, because yeah. he like is, is he, he goes off on it. He's a little out of control. He really is. He really is. Let me let me read just a couple more bits from this Heidi McDonald interview, and I want to make sure we we touch on the letter column stuff, and then we should also um, decide if we want to talk about the Trevor Von Eden chair incident at DC, which was the infamous we have to. kind of we have thing. To. Okay, we have yeah, because that was the thing that Trevor yeah. said really just sort of was the final straw for him at DC Comics. But we'll get into that. Okay, so the Heidi McDonald Comics Journal thing. So obviously Heidi's considering this book very deeply and carefully, and and I appreciate that. And so she says next, getting into her discussion of Von Eden's work, Heidi says, Von Eden tries to do away with some of the basic linear progressions that we have come to associate with the comics medium. One of the paradoxical conventions of comics is that although panels occur in sequence, we have to read them like print left to right and jumping to the left again. This is, of course, one of the most powerful subliminal tools that comics have to work with. On several pages... Page 10 of number one, or the double page spread 13 and 14 in number two. Von Eden actually lays it out so that the panels snake across in an unbroken line. The double page spread in particular is an extremely difficult page and is a summation of the problems and triumphs of the book. What is happening is that Dan Grove argues with Cracker Jack over breakfast, is introduced to baby Scotty, and meets the sinister babysitter Malokia, whom he seems to remember. The bizarre layout forces us to experience this sequence just as Dan does with the attendant disorientation, but the burden of enigmatic storytelling on an already enigmatic plot through plot thread may be too much to take. A catalog of Von Eden's experiments would be huge, and I won't try. 
on several pages, st- <laughs> which is which is great though, because I think that's referencing the thing that, that I said earlier about like how Trevor seems to invent a new storytelling mechanic or modality with every page, and then immediately discard it. Which is yeah, obviously a risky thing to yeah. do, but holy shit, is it inventive and breathtaking to witness? So she says a catalog of Von Eden's experiments would be huge, and I won't try. On several pages, storytelling is warped so that every panel follows every other, follows as in quotes. Subjective is taken to such extremes as the already notorious helicopter page in Thriller Number 1 on which Dan falls off a building only to be rescued by Beaker Parrish in his chopper. A series of narrow diagonal panels show the page being sliced to ribbons by the helicopter blades. Von Eden says he was trying but failed to recreate a dream of falling he once had, but it comes close enough. It's a scene of frightening intensity, one of the very finest in the series. Just to prove that in Thriller, no one shies away from wrapping an enigma in a secret and shrouding it with mystery, Von Eden also uses a very difficult style of art. Not at all pretty in the Neil Adams, Barry Windsor Smith sense, but I nonetheless find it very moving. The much vaunted expressionism of Miller and Jansen is to Von Eden as Richard Strauss is to Anton Weeburn. I'm guessing these are some like fine art references, which I totally don't get. No, they're composers. Are they composers? Oh, oh shit. Strauss okay. The, oh, Strauss. Oh, composers. shit. Yeah, Thank you, Chris. Composers. This yeah. is why I'm glad yeah. you're on the podcast. You're here for the high art references. <laughs> exactly. Because I'm here. <laughs> I'm, I'm filling some of the low art. You referenced something earlier where it was like, uh, you were talking about some example of something of like original storytelling. I forget you referenced something really incredible. And in my mind, my example was going to be, I love Lucy. <laughs> it was, like, was going to be like, it was like when you were talking about how shit, when no one's done it before, like you look at it now and you think, Oh, what's so special. But it's like, you look back at certain things. Like, oh oh yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, La Strada. I, yeah, La Strada. Right, right, right. La Strada. I was yeah. like, I was yeah. going to say, I love Lucy. I'm just going to shut up. Cause Chris just said La Strada. So I'm going to let him, I'm going to let him go with that. It's better. Um, but yeah, anyways, so then, so she says, uh, Von Eden's obvious comics model is Alex Toth. But beyond this, Thriller is about as close as will ever come to what if Edver, Edvard Munch drew comic books. So I get that. That's I get that reference. That's the dude who yeah. drew the scream. Okay. Right. So now Thriller is expressionism in the highest sense of the word, depicting what one historian termed a, what, what, depicting, depicting what one historian termed a spectrally heightened and distorted actuality. The appearance is the object. Malokia's spikes of hair and huge-eyed bird face are Malokia. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, throughout the first six issues, Von Eden displays a very high standard of drawing. There are hardly any weaknesses in the underlying structures. This is not the slick, emotionless art to which comics fans are accustomed. Let me say that again. This is not the slick, emotionless art to which comics fans are accustomed. I got to really give it up to Heidi McDonald because I feel like she is nailing it in so much of this review and kind of it's interesting circling around a lot of the stuff that you and I talked about and we had not read this review. I had gla- oh, I I gla- read, no. yeah, you've never read. I glanced at it, but I never read the whole thing. Um, and I haven't looked at it for a while. And so here she goes on to say, one can feel Von Eden struggling to make even the tiniest line count toward the emotional resonance. And much of the time it works. Never have cheekbones and chins jutted so intensely. Never have fingers splayed so expressively. And so then um, I'm not going to read any more of this because it goes on for another two pages. But it's, I think, an incredible review from Heidi McDonald where it's really difficult, I have to say, to properly be able to um, analyze an incredibly progressive work of art in its own time. You know, because you don't have the benefit of history. You don't have sort of the hindsight is 2020 of it all. You're not able to sort of look from a distance and have this sort of, you know, this view that gives you a greater sort of uh, 
expanse of of time and and history to consider you're there in the moment writing a review of a new comic that came out that is like nothing else that has been released by these companies and i gotta say heidi mcdonald to me really nails it with her incredible analysis of the book in the moment it's dropped she's able to immediately take in the originality of what they are doing to appreciate the emotion and the underlying solidity of everything trevor is doing just like we were talking about and but yet she's also talking about, yes, it's not entirely su- successful in terms of pure storytelling because maybe the story from Robert Lauren Fleming is just too oblique. But I think she's celebrating the work for how incredibly well it succeeds on so many levels. And and I thought that was super dope. So I just wanted to share a little bit of that as part of our content today. No, it's dope because the thing is, is like you're right. It's like we're not saying this book is without its flaws. It certainly is, and and she has she's highlighted a a bunch of them. What I appreciate, I, I want to go back to something you said about she's she's reviewing this at the time. What's difficult about work like this is is that five years after this comes out and it's been around for a while, people have talked about it, and blah blah blah. It's influenced other people. You know, yep. like this book, this book comes out and the first year that it's out, first when it's being published, no one is able to like apprehend it, you know, and go, how do I digest this? Is there anything for me to digest and, and put into my style? And that's why I say when you look at this work and you go, oh, three or four years later, you see this kind of stuff in Matt Wagner's work. Five, six years later, you see it in Mazzuccelli's work. Like you see it in the other people's work later yes you know, yes it's like that with it's like that with with any with anybody who does art that kind of like sh- that kind of shifts the boundary and like you said earlier there's like this atomic bomb drop and it's like the radiation this guy's yeah. work goes off yes it takes a while for it to filter out yeah. it's like that in a lot of people's work you know it's just so much um it's 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 a it's just you it takes a it's interesting that she's able to like point that out and think about how I just again, the stuff he does that just makes you just, it just yeah he's trying stuff all the time. Her point about how art, comic art is very is very emotionless. I think that really has to go back to what I was saying before about how he's drawing stuff without people with masks, because mm. you don't have to draw anyone's face to a believable degree if you have a mask on it. Yeah, and and the and 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 then you're not drawing anybody's eyes, like yep. you, like Superman and not Superman, but like Spider Man and Batman, like their their eye sockets in their costumes do kind of like you know approximate what your eyes are. like. If he's surprised, then the eye things are a little bigger, you know, or whatever. But but without having to draw the full face of people, particularly your heroes, where they're in the the heart of battle. You know, it's like the Kirby style is like is like what their beha- what their physical behavior is doing is telling me the story, and this guy's work is like I'm physical behaving you, but I'm but I'm not doing it as much as I'm I'm going to use a lot of panels to help like sell you on the emotion. And I'm going to use facial expressions. I mean, look, th- 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 she referenced that thing in what was this issue two when the snaking thing, this Cracker Jack thing, and stuff like that. Yeah, like. Okay, so that's crazy in eighty three, right? Eighty four, but when, but but when like J H Williams does this and like the Sandman thing he did last last thing right. he did, it's like it's old hat. Yeah, you know, it's it, true. It's, it's old hat for him, you know. But that's twenty. That's thirty years later. <laughs> yes, totally. You know? And it's like Trevor's work has been fully digested into comics and it's been fully injected into the bloodstream of comics now or like you said the radiation from the bomb that he dropped with his incredible explosion of work has now radiated out to where people who are influenced by trevor von eden don't even realize that they're influenced by trevor von eden because they think they're influenced by dave mazzuccelli or they think they're influenced by matt wagner who were all no doubt studying trevor's work and trevor was the one by mazzuccelli's own admission 
Trevor was the one pushing the boundaries farther than any of these cats. And Mazzuccelli felt his work looked, quote, tame compared to Trevor's. So if Mazzuccelli's telling you Trevor's pushing his work farther than anyone and is really out there on the bleeding edge, then who do you think is really influencing people in future generations? The people who are actually taking those risks. And it's sad, yeah. you know, in art, sometimes yeah. those people who take the risks, they get sometimes burned up. And they don't get you never known about. Never yeah, known about. they don't get the credit that they deserve from except from other artists. And so, like, that's why it's so important again, to talk about him. Yeah, because, again, it's like what I was seeing you earlier. It's like. Like, there's times that we hang out and we'll talk about, hey, did you see this movie? Did you see this movie? Did you yeah. see this movie? You know, these guys are saying, hey, did you read this comic? You read this comic. You see this. You see this yep. guy's doing it. because that's what's going on. Here's something I just I just I just noticed. When you were, because I was trying to find the page that she was referencing, and I picked up the wrong issue. But it's issue four, mm-hmm. um, the final page of issue four, right? Okay. So it's page twenty-three of uh, issue four. So he does something in the the, the first panel. There's three rows. First panel. Wait, what? Draws, what pa- I'm sorry. What page again? I'm trying to find it. Just twenty-three. 23. Page 23, okay. issue 4. Okay. It's the first panel in the bottom row. Mm-hmm. Silhouettes with the zip tone. Mm. Oh. I've never seen anybody yeah. do that. Oh, yeah, you're right. That is... I've actually never seen anybody that, do that. That is beautiful. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone do that either in comics. If so, it's certainly not a common effect. And if I, <laughs> yeah, what are you talking about? yeah, because the panel is it's a panel, yeah, it's a white page, yeah, it's a panel that's a white panel with no background, yeah, and it's just a silhouette, yeah, of people, and he's done it in a yeah. way with a zip tone, and it's like it's crazy, and there's, there's no more zip tone on the rest of this page, no, not I mean, at all. I think I, I don't think it's in this whole book. No, he's just, no. just like, how do I do this part? Yeah, yeah. And let's you know? let's just look at the emotion on this page, Chris, because Trevor does so many things so well. This page is a nice little microcosm. The other thing I want to be sure to mention, because I forget if we touched on it before, but Trevor's use of negative space, you can see it a little bit on this page and just the way the panels in Trevor Von Eden's work are very rarely, if ever, just butted up against each other or having just traditional panel gutters. Trevor likes his panels kind of floating in space and rearranged with lots of negative space around them in a way that feels really jarring, jarringly original because so few artists, particularly at this time, were doing this. But Trevor's not concerned about wasting space on the page. He's using the negative space to make a point and to emphasize the emotion he wants to emphasize. It all feels very intentional. But you've got this page itself, Chris, just there's so many emotional moments. It's like the look on what is that salvo at the top there? And then his mother and her face. And then when he says no ma, and like, it looks like He's not quite crying, but almost. And then he grabs his mother in a hug. And then his mom cries. Then you got that beautiful silhouette panel you called out. And then just look at the, there's Beaker Parish, the nine foot tall priest. But then look at the shading on Salvo in that second to last panel. It looks like Trevor just grabbed like a, a fucking Bic pen and just scrawled out some incredibly fast, like it's not cross hatching. It's just a bunch of vertical lines to invoke some shade on Salvo's face. And he does kind of a similar thing on mom's face. Actually, if you look at mom's face in panel four, it's got that same big scratchiness oh, mixed with just a tiny, yeah. tiny dash of zipitone. And yeah, but the yeah. emotion real faint. Real really faint. faint, really faint and so subtle. And the emotion on this page, though, like you're saying, without masks here, like, as you said, Trevor drawing people's faces is just stunning because the acting on all these faces is so subtle, so, so exquisite. And then also, if this is Tom Zuko, whoever coloring it, the colorist really kills it in that last panel, too. It's just a beautiful sunset and just deeply emotional work. Like Heidi, like Heidi McDonald said, too, you don't see this kind of emotion on a comics page hardly ever, especially not fucking mainstream comics. No, well, uh, because they because people don't tell stories like this. Like even in Vertigo books, there's a like Vertigo books are more fantastical than yeah. superhero books, but they still kind of lean toward the weird twist 
the 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 genre aspect yes. of a, any story. Yep. Not taking anything away from it at all. But it's like, you know, the book that everyone will love and say, Oh, I love this book, it's so inventive is Sandman. Sandman is not this emotional. You know, or it no, might not be at all. like it might be like in the final issue of a story arc. You know, like the final issue of like a doll's house or something like that. Yeah, you know, but the rest of it is I mean, or except maybe those ones that there's that Charles Vest one he did. Uh, the Charles Vest did two issues that were like um, Miss Summer's Night Dream and stuff like that. Like, see, ch- ch- like Charles Vest's work kind of feels like this. Like these, like Charles Vest. Yeah, I, know, I could see that. That's actually a good know, reference, Chris. I hadn't thought about that. Vest's work has a delicacy to it, like a really fine line, illustrative delicacy that Von Eden also kind of conjures at, at moments here. That's a great. That's a great pull. That's a really cool reference. I never thought about that, but I think you're right on. Well, you know what's interesting about Charles Vest? I always forget this because I always remember from doing that Sandman book, right? Because that's because when everyone asked me to read about well, like why do you like comics? Do you like comics? Comics are superheroes? Blah blah blah. I go no no no. Comics are way more than that. I always give them that Midsummer's Night Dream issue of yeah. Sandman because it's such an inventive piece of work and. Vest makes it sing in a way that as cool as Gaiman's pencil, I mean, story is other artists on that Sandman series wouldn't have done that. As you said, as delicately. And it's just like the power of that, but the cool, yeah. but I, it was funny is that I always forget this, but there's a, a cover for web of Spider-Man number one. Oh yeah. That, that Charles vested. I can picture and, that. Yeah. It's Spidey in the black and, costume. Yeah. yeah. The black costume. And it's like all kind of like, like smoked out and stuff like that. I'm just like, yeah, this guy could do it all too. It's like, uh, I mean, that's why I'm cu- That's why I want to go back. I mean, well, while we were talking, I, I put in a bid for, um, <laughs> I, I, I put in a bid on eBay for what, for the Batman animal. Oh, because, beautiful. Dope. <laughs> uh, b- b- because I want to see my theory about not drawing faces has, I mean, like what that does to his work. I don't think it probably does that much, but I do believe it does, will do something to the work. Yeah. Um, and I feel like, I think that issue, I think the 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 Green Arrow miniseries he did mm-hmm. is like, I think Green Arrow is wearing that costume with the hood, you know, that I, I think that's, I think he wasn't just wearing the mask, you know, the hat, like the 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 Robin Hood hat. I think yeah. he's wearing that hood I'm from not, the long I'm hunters. not sure. I'm not sure if he is wearing the hood. He might be. I haven't looked at the miniseries for a minute, but it's it's a beautifully drawn miniseries. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Giordano inks Trevor on Green Arrow. So I think Giordano Giordano must have been, I would think, a fan of Trevor's or appreciated Trevor's work because I don't see Giordano wanting to ink multiple stories by this young artist unless he was a fan of his. Giordano had to see something in the work that he found exciting that he that he kept wanting to ink Trevor's work because at that point he was one of the top execs at DC I don't think he had to ink anybody he didn't want to ink yeah that's all like a hey I want to do something cool to, like this month you know yeah kind of thing for Giordano. I, would, I would think so um and uh I mean but uh, you're lo- looking at it again it's not it's he's he's not wearing a hood yet but I feel like um I feel you look if you were at DC at the time I bet you nobody but Dick Giordano could say I want to ink your book yeah and get opportunity to do it yep because he's he's too he's a high high level executive and he's a well respected artist I bet all the other fucking like inkers at the time with those kind of journeyman guys uh, be, I bet Trevor would be like fuck that fuck that <laughs> He's yeah, not gonna fuck up my work. Yeah, he's not gonna fuck up my work because I because I I know that I I'm sure that his work had been damaged in his or mind. Fucked up. When yeah, he was doing. Other, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, other, and other, like, for sure, I'm sure it must have been. Yeah, and like I don't know if Trevor had the you know the ability to pick and choose inkers, and Trevor needed somebody who could really ink you know original work, and frankly. Giordano probably did about as good a job as you could hope for on some level. And I think Giordano's inking of Trevor was trying to capture what Trevor was doing, but with a slightly more of like a probably conventional, traditional polish. And and I think that that polish, along with your mask theory about superheroes, which I think is correct. I think the masks issue has a lot to do with the lack of emotionality in superhero comics. And I think the other big element, though, 
in to kind of to what Heidi was saying and what we talked about earlier is the finish and like the polished finish of mainstream comics and that like quote unquote professional inking finish that you get from like these serious kind of house style inkers. I think it, it kind of has a, an effect of blunting the emotion or the vitality of the work often. And, and I think that's why you hear people lamenting so much about, oh, there was so much magic in the pencils, but it's not quite there. And I really feel like that was part of Trevor's project is how can you capture that magic, that energy, that sort of joy of creation and the emotion that's imbued in what you're doing? How can you allow that to survive in the inks? And I think Trevor was pulling out all the stops in order to like make it survive in, in a way that like, you know, it really separates his work. Well, okay. I think those are all fantastic points. I think the one thing that we're not, we're kind of looking over. I mean, you mentioned it slightly before, but is the colorist. Yeah. Because if you look at some of these pages and you look at how, I, I'm curious, I'd be so curious to know how Trevor is working with the colorist. Yes. Because. Me too. Like, on, because, like, on that page you mentioned, what was that page we just talked about where the the mom, was that on four, the end of four? I think it was the end of four, yeah. The the one, like the last page of issue four, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, well, that's not a good example, but it's like there's certain pages. Oh, no, I'll tell you what it is. We'll go back to that one in, uh, in page seven or eight in issue one right sure so the, the, the thing with the with the five panels going across if you look at that it's like the way it's colored right so the guy's face is like fine right but the blue that is doing the shadow like he's like like all that hatching work you know with a regular anchor that's all blacked out like you said so it's like a car skewer thing but he just has to have talked with, like, if you look at that last panel, uh, the five on the top, where it says, you can't be gone. Okay. Like, there's, like, three different shades of blue that's telling me the shadow, right? There's, like, the shadow on his nose is a deeper blue than what's on his forehead. And this deeper, and this, and the one on his cheek is in between yeah, the forehead and the you're nose. you're right. Yes. So, so it's like, so I'm, I'm curious if and or, or even the one at the bottom of the page in the bottom bottom left when he's crying a little scene with the crying and it's like purple yeah blue purple then, then another moth yeah it's like 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 how is he talking this is why i i he, he's like hey i'm not inking this book so you the colorist are helping me like yeah. convey yeah. a lot. Or, or I am I am inking it, but I'm inking it in these scratchy, delicate, expressionistic lines. So it's not going to be like traditional comic book inking. So 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 we got to collaborate here on the emotion because clearly, I think you're right, Chris. Zuko, the colorist, seems like they are all in because this is some really inventive and you know intentional and beautiful coloring too. And the thing is, again, you look at this today. And you go, oh well, yeah, with fucking digital, yeah, this is yeah, that's what that's what you easy. do, yeah, right. But, easy, but back, easy but back digital. then, back yeah, then, this is wild. No one is doing yeah. this. You, it's, I mean, like, I mean, to be able to do that kind of colors, do that kind of like, like, if, like, uh, like, look at the part when the guy's crying, right in that little corner, right. Mm-hmm. If you look at his nose, there's that thin strip of blue mm-hmm. before it's purple. Yes, you know, and it's like. Dude, to be able to like get that in there with with the with the way they had the color pages back yeah. then. Oh God, no! And look at that whole face, Chris. It's like you got the yellow edging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yellow rim white mm-hmm. the photographer. Then it's like in a, when he drops down into the shadow, you got two different colors of the blue and the magenta. It's just like it's just it's so it's. I mean. I, you know, there was that one Lynn Varley issue of Daredevil. Mm-hmm. Daredevil when Daredevil goes to visit um, Bullseye. Bullseye. Yeah, he's yeah. Dropped, he's in the, in the hospital. That has got this type of coloring in it. This level yep. of like really high and advanced work that I feel if you were a comic artist, you were a penciler and someone was, co- was coloring your work like this. 
Yeah. You'd be in love with them. Oh, so yeah, exactly. Like, right. Yeah. And fucking, that's so funny you say that. Cause you Miller, work with me. Yeah, because Miller literally did fall in love with Lynn Varley. And then David Mazzuchelli literally did fall in love with Richmond Lewis, who also, yeah. I don't know if they were together before or after she colored his work, but she did also color his work. And that's, yeah, it's actually amazing because there were just a handful of colorists, like you say, at that time that were doing work on this level. And, um, you know, Zuko doesn't get talked about as much as your Lynn Varley's or even your Richmond Lewis's. Uh, because he didn't color Batman Year One or Dark Knight. But I think right. you're right on though, Chris. Like this coloring, if you keep turning the pages in issue one, you've got that crazy double page spread that we talked about before, the one that's on my mantle. The coloring right. on Angie's hair is just unbelievable. Just talk about all the different mix of colors and how much time that must have taken the colorist. You know, just really clearly putting his heart and soul into this too. And then that next page after the double page spread is also one of my favorite pages in the whole series where it's just the first time that that guy, I guess, uh, Daniel Grove is talking to Angie Thriller as this disembodied godhead in the sky when he's on the bridge about to jump. Right. And man, look at that paneling. Just look at just that is just such a, a stunning page of comic art. Like I would kill to have the original art for this page here. Like. It is just an incredible page. I can't even describe the paneling looks almost like a, a stained glass window that's been fractured into shards, but it's actually the sides of the bridge. And if you look at it, Chris, I'm actually just noticing this maybe for the first time. Like if you look at it from a distance, the panel borders and the black gutters, if you hold the page at a distance, it looks like it, the entire page is like one macro mega panel of him standing on the bridge with the middle panel being like yeah. standing on the bridge. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I didn't fucking yeah, see that till just, just now. Yeah. I feel like yeah. uh, this is fucking wild. <laughs> that is yeah. the most clever I, yeah. fucking panel design and page design I've ever seen. It's you literally, I've looked at this page hundreds of times. This is the first time I ever noticed what I think he's actually doing. He's actually trying to do with the, with the, with the, with the page yeah, layout. It's like the page layout that looks like fractured kind of stained glass or something. I think it's these geometric panels that are actually approximating the like the, the art bridge. and the yeah. bridge and like the fucking metal lines of the bridge from a distance. And yet they're also serving as panels. Like it is exquisite. It's fucking insane. We'll definitely put this page in our show notes. Yeah. Cause this, but the, I mean, again, but the top of the, the top sets of panel on this page where it's like, it's kind of zooming in on, on Daniel Grove from afar. Yes. Like that's so dope because he's got no panel boards. It's just like, yeah, image, 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 oh, image, image. Oh, you're right. It's just like, it's just, and, but it's this macro. It's like, the, yes. it's like a zoom shot in a movie. <laughs> you're right. But it's, so it's just like, dude, it's, I mean, this is just on know. another just, level, man. He's just on yeah. another level. See, it's stuff like this. I see. I can understand why Jim Shooter would be like, Hey man, you're fucking up. Cause you're not showing simple <laughs> shit. <laughs> Yes. But at the same time, I know why all these other artists are like, my God, this motherfucker got away with this? <laughs> yeah. He got away with all this? He got away with this. Shit, no. Exactly. Now, but see, here's the thing about this. This is what I think is a good segue into the chair incident. Mm. Because he's doing stuff. He's, quote unquote, getting away with stuff that no one else probably could get away with. Yeah. And the thing, and now this is a double-edged sword. Uh, that also has to do with probably him being black, and I'll say this right. I bet you everyone's on their. I bet you they. This is where the racism is probably really insidious for him. This is post civil rights movement. No one wants to upset the black people. No one wants to really seem like they're racist still. So they're not gonna. They're not gonna like overtly make comments. They're gonna find these subversion ways, these microaggressions to fuck with him. Which 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 leads to this this chair incident, which we should talk about because it, yeah, you know. which is a bummer, and it's like I mean it's a shitty sad incident because it really points to what we're discussing why Trevor ultimately lost the enthusiasm for working in mainstream comics and specifically at DC at this time and you know and the thriller series was not able to be completed the way that it could have been. Um, here in the Comics Journal interview that we referenced earlier with Michelle Fife, um, Trevor says, um, in response to Fife asking, uh, Fife says, to this day, Thriller stands as an underrated watermark in comics held in high regard by pros and fans alike. It's safe to say that Thriller would not have been the same without your artistic input. Having said that, how do you feel about the notion that as Thriller editor Alan Gold felt... 
And then here's a quote from Alan Gold, which is fucking unreal. Uh, Alan Gold said, quote, fans believed they were in the presence of profundity because they didn't know how to appreciate its, its elliptical narrative. So FIFA is mentioning this highly offensive quote from their own editor about their series. Like, this is just mind-blowing. Uh, what was the overall reaction? So this is FIFA asking, what was the overall reaction to such a project? And here's Trevor's answer. And this gets into the chair incident. Trevor says, he corrects Alan Gold's quote, first off. Trevor says, fans were in the presence of profundity. <laughs> unequivocally he says that and then he goes on to say with the first few issues of thriller especially the first two it was the direct abuse and neglect of its editorial staff that murdered that book very slowly profundity is not something black men were supposed to be associated with in american comics at the time okay and this is obviously speaking chris to exactly what you've been talking about he goes on to say, by this, I mean me, not fictional characters like Black Lightning, Luke Cage, or even the great African king T'Challa. Actually, when Jack Kirby created the Black Panther, fans were then in the presence of great profundity, a black man as king. Gasp. But Kirby's entire output was so profound in and of itself that the blackness of the character was never a factor. Kirby's panther was a king, period. But then again, so were all of Kirby's heroes, just like the man. Okay, just as a side note here, Trevor just gave an incredible celebration, you know, and appreciation of Jack Kirby there in the midst of answering a question where someone was asking Trevor about his work, about Thriller. And Trevor goes off for a paragraph about the profundity and brilliance of Jack Kirby. Again, I just want to point out the generosity of spirit in Von Eden where he's not just all about himself. He's talking about these other great artists who influenced him. And, you know, like Mazzuchelli, Von Eden's also secure enough to talk about his influences and celebrate them, you know, in a big hearted, unequivocal way, which I think points to like a strength of character and a confidence that, you know, is worth noting. So, so then Von Eden goes right. on, he goes on to say though, he says, uh, what Alan Gold meant was that the editorial staff didn't know that the, he meant he's what he meant was the editorial staff didn't know how to appreciate or understand the book's concept, much less its quote elliptical narrative, whatever the hell that means. The book was straightforward storytelling of an original concept. They just didn't get it. Others did. The overall reaction from fans, I don't know. The overall reaction from editors. Well, they called me into the offices with newbie Alan Gold and tried to pull the collapsing chair stunt on me. If I'd not refused to sit in the only chair made available while my editor stood, my ass would have hit the ground instead of Alan's. After my third refusal to sit, he took the chair to avoid a confrontation. He ended up with a pain in his ass. I ended up with a useful bit of information about the people I worked for. And so then Fife drills down and Fife says, let me get this right. A prank that was supposed to be at your expense was intercepted by rookie editor Alan Gold. Why would this be done to you or anyone? Was it personal animosity, direct racism, commonplace in the office, or just some sort of initiation? I've heard industry horror stories before, but I'm having trouble placing the motivation behind the, quote, pranksters and why such action was tolerated by anyone. And Trevor replies, no. The chair incident was no prank. It was a corporate effort to embarrass me and, quote, bring me down to earth, so to speak. Partly because I was an artist slash employee on the rise, mostly because I was a black artist slash man on the rise. No prank, but a power play designed to humiliate. I wasn't humiliated. I was infuriated. And that was my mistake. Because in the end, it was my career that suffered, not DC Comics. Okay, and that's really 
heartbreaking and tragic, Chris, and it actually points back to what you said earlier about the Toni Morrison quote about the the point of racism on some level is to distract people from what was it to distract people from being great or from focusing on accomplishing things. Just, yeah, 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 right. And that's exactly what Trevor's speaking to. There is like he became so understandably so infuriated that his colleagues, his coworkers, his editors are trying to pull fucking shitty humiliating fucking frat boy stunts on him in some way to humiliate him in the office that obviously that infuriated him, but it caused him to not be able to do the brilliant work in the way that he'd been doing and his career suffered. And it's just such a shitty fucking tragic thing about comics to treat somebody like Trevor Von Eden like that. It's just, it's disgusting and it's, and it's heartbreaking because you think about all the work you could have had for Trevor Von Eden and DC Comics obviously every comics company has made this mistake for time immemorial whether it's Alan Moore or Trevor Von Eden the geniuses in comics do not get treated the way that they deserve to be treated and comics is far poorer for it well two things a couple things on that one you said Alan Moore and things like that and he's, he's geniuses the thing of it is, it's just like in in Hollywood. It's like people who push the envelope with their narratives, with their arts, with their visuals, whatever it is. The 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 rank like the people like editors and stuff like that, or producers or development execs, those people aren't hired if they have oddball tastes. You know, because then you become a liability because then you start putting out because then you start okaying projects that have that the, the, the commercial gamble is too high. Now, if you get so if so, if you're if you're if you if you're being a good steward of your corporation, you hire people who are what's that phrase, you know, like the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 like you, you hire people to be the hammer. Because you can't let those people thrive. Those people, like everybody who's thrived on that level, they they they, be, they do it outside of Hollywood, right? They do it outside of the thing. You know, like in Hollywood, like you look at someone like a Barry Jenkins, right? Like Barry Jenkins, he's so ensconced in the Hollywood thing now. He's doing the Lion King sequel and stuff like that. But to do um, Moonlight... This triptych story, so there's no real big, like each, each each act is a different, you know, story. You know, this guy's life, but it's, it's you know, ten years, whatever transpired between each act. It's a story about a black man coming to terms with being a homosexual, and it's got some stylistic flourishes to it that are pretty that are pretty pronounced and borrowed from his love for Wong Kar Wai, and that is nothing that people who are going to say, I'm going to, Hey, I want to put the reputation of my uh, film company on the line and spend some money. And, yeah. and that's really my reputation on the line by saying, Hey, go ahead and do this. So he's going to go out and get the money on himself and find people to do it. And that's, and then he's pro And then it wins the Academy award because he's taken such a big swing and everyone and it, and he and, and he knocked it out the park, and then it's like, wow, let's give him another shot. Let's keep giving him shots, and not saying he's not deserving of them, but you know, he's only able to do that because he makes it succeed. Yep. And if you're black, that becomes a harder thing because there's expectations about what you should be doing as your art, and it's not just black people saying to you do black work; it's white people who are saying. I don't think you can do it, do anything but black work, you yeah, know? Right. So, so he's, so, so he's in, so he, so Trevor's balancing this thing. I think also because he's young it at this time, it, he engenders a lot of fucking hate. Uh, I mean, you know, I think about this a lot. It's like, you know, there's, you know, there's such a thing in Hollywood where the, the, that the young white male, uh, can succeed and 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 he's ba- and he always says a lot on the other podcast. He's like, you get a shot based on your potential, you know. And if you're not a white male, you get your shot based upon your resume. And and how do you build a resume if you don't get opportunities? 
you know yep um so it's very so so then what happens is is that black people in this in this industry they get the success they have in their in their like 40s you know 50s you know and it's like they've kind of like missed that young opportunity to, i mean the chance to be like the the burning sensation in their 20s you know like spike lee and barry jenkins and uh um uh guy who died recently uh did boys in the hood um john singleton john singleton are like the only i mean i mean those guys who come to mind like oh yeah 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 and obviously like d reed i think d reed is a little older though i, I don't think she was that young when yeah she, she wasn't i don't think she was in her 20s like when she did pariah you know so it's like it's i mean and obviously bridge was like in his 30s when he's doing um um moonlight yeah. how old was how old was spike when he made she's gotta have it like late 20s I think he was like 29, 29. Yeah, yeah. But but to your point, he had to go outside the system and finance it himself, obviously. Right. Just like right. with Moonlight, you know, exactly like you're saying. Spike gets hailed as a genius, deservedly so, because he goes out and he finances these early films himself. And he just makes these incredibly original, extraordinary works. But it's not like anybody would have financed those movies in the studio system. No, I mean, and, and, and to you also hailed as a genius to a degree because it's like you were able to thread the needle of, I got a cool piece of art that is, that is, that is transgressive and I got money to do it. I got, yeah, I, I got, I got, I, yeah. I can get someone to put money to do it because a lot of people, they got these pieces of work that would be cool, cool scripts or cool short films, whatever it is that are just like, wow, man, like if I, I'm trying to raise money to do this movie, I want to do this movie, I want to do this movie, blah, blah, blah. And they never get it done because they don't know how to balance the, 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 the two like necessary traits. That's to... interesting. That's like a different type of genius in a way, right? It's like, yeah. how do you thread that needle? Because I've heard people say something exactly like what you're saying, just about Orson Welles, that so much of the genius of Orson Welles wasn't just the aesthetic artistic genius. It was the fact that he put himself in a position to have the level of control that he had at the age of 25 over a film that he was starring in and directing that was his, his first film ever. And, and yet, producing and producing, co-writing. Yeah. Producing, co-writing, and the fact that he was 25 and he got to do all that, that is the exact same thing like you're talking about, right? It's like threading that needle as a human being. How do you even put yourself in a position to be entrusted with the keys to, to the castle at that young of an age? Yeah, I mean, and, and obviously Orson Welles, you know, he fucking he fucking uh, self self immolation, <laughs> self self immolated. Yep, <laughs> yeah, self immolated with that with that project. But that, but I but I think that movie and him is hailed because he did it at such a young age. And I think a lot of people are like, well, how, like how do I become Welles and I can be blah blah blah. But it's like, yeah, but he's a big radio star, huge radio star, and a huge Broadway star. Which is still, I think, is even more mind blowing because you're like, how do you come like a huge radio and Broadway star <laughs> at 22? Yes. At 23, you know, but, yeah, you know, you know, because he, you, I know I was about this because I read this, but it's like, but he turned Hollywood down, mm. you know, t- three times. Wow, they gave him what he wanted. Oh shit! Because oh, they were, hey, can you come and wow. act? Can you come act? He's like, I don't want to act for y'all. And he's I'm like, okay, can, can you come and write and act? I don't want to come and write and act for y'all. I want to direct because I direct on Broadway. And he was like, hey, all right, so can you come and write and direct and act? He's like, no, 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 no. I'll come write, direct, act if I can produce as produce as well because that's what the power is. And that's so you that's what he got, you know, because he turned them. Most people would say the first time the Hollywood comes knocking, they're saying yes, right. You know, absolutely. He, yep. You know, because most of the times you don't have a career, you're trying to get one. But he had a big career in the arts, and he didn't need that. You know, and that's what that's what gave him the position. But do you say to yourself, how did he become a like fucking big on Broadway at 20, 22? Yeah. Because he wasn't able to do Voodoo Macbeth and the the season, the fascist Caesars that he did, and the war. The, uh, look. <laughs> War of the Worlds was what thirty nine. I, I mean, that alone. If that was the only thing he ever did, he'd be a legend, right? But so that so 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 that's two years before um, Citizen Kane is War of the Worlds. So that puts him at twenty three, right? Yeah. But to be able to, at twenty three to be able to have the 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 trust 
of the sponsors and the radio station to let you pull that kind of gamble <laughs> yeah. means that he had to have like a year or two of convincing them I can make you money. Mm-hmm. And that's really where the real level of like of and and Trevor, like Dennis Cowan, you're getting to work as a professional comic artist in your teens. Yeah. That's when most people are like still doing those shitty sketchbooks in the back of class. Yep. And <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, when they're like 14, 15, and but he's actually not a professional artist, you know, which is crazy. I, th- I, th- I think Rob became a professional artist around his what 19 or 20, something like that, too. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And and for the record, I, I have an appreciation of the uh, the early Rob Liefeld work. I'm a, I'm a big fan of some of the early Liefeld, but but yeah, but I. I take your point that like Trevor and, uh, you know, Dennis, like they were doing work at a very sophisticated level in their, in their fucking teens, which is mind blowing. Well, see, but see, look, that's another example of what's going on with, with, with the inherent racism, right. And the inherent thing of like the promise of the young kid who can deliver is that if Rob is 18, 19, that's when he's doing that work at Marvel and creating like Shatterstar and Deadpool and everything like that. That's the same age that Trevor Ron Eden is talking about where he's coming to, you know, around this time period. Like he's already done, um, this is the time he's doing the Batman annual, right? He's telling me I, I got to do my manifesto and blah, blah, blah. Is that he's not getting the same love from anybody. Because right. there's, an inter- there's an interesting story that Rob Liefeld tells on his podcast, Rob Observations, where he was like, I went to that Golden Apples thing, the Golden Apple Comic Con to sell some comic, was the first issue of X-Force or something like that. And he mm-hmm. went with, he went with uh, Jeff Loeb, you know, right. and, they, and Jeff Loeb was like, I've been to South Africa, I've never been to Spig. Well, it's just this, like the, 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 the lines around the block. And it's like, where's the Jeff Loeb who's hanging out with, Trevor Von Eden. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like the elder that's, statesman. That's, and, I think, I mean, he had and, Neil Adams. He had Neil, Neil Adams, you know, early on and, but, and he worked with him, you know, for quite a while, but it's hard to know how much of a hands-on mentor Neil was. Cause like Trevor said, Trevor was learning being around Neil, but that Neil wasn't necessarily teaching. So, well, but, but he also said that he learned, he was doing commercial art for Neil. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And, and by this time, like, like Neil wasn't doing commercial art mm-hmm. and the, but the difference between Jeff Loeb, and Neil Adams is like the Jeff Loeb, Rob Liefeld is. That's an artist and a writer who are hanging out. Yeah, that's true. And the and the writer who's older and can like kind of help you with your storytelling and this is what you got to do. This is how how I'm going to help you tell it and blah blah blah. That is like a different relationship. So you can thrive as a writer and help you work because because Rob quickly begins writing and and drawing stuff. You know because he's hanging out with fucking Jeff Loeb. Yeah, and it's like that is what like obviously Trevor doesn't have that. That's the crime of him being like a phenom black artist yeah. at a time when it's not really loved. It's not really loved now. I can't think of too many black artists who work in the main in, work at Marvel and DC. I mean, I'm sure there are obviously like, what's his name? Like Jeff Thorne writes for Marvel of DC. Right? Yeah. He's your buddy, the, your buddy, Jeff Thorne. Yeah. 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 He's writing that the green arrows. I mean, the green lantern stuff, but what is 2021 yeah i mean you know, we're talking we're talking about 1980 I, yeah i don't know honestly because i'm not familiar enough with the current roster at dc or marvel just because you know i'm not i'm not following yeah. that many of the modern books I, I can't really say i don't know the the ethnic sort of makeup of the artists today but but yeah it's obviously been a huge um you know tragedy in comics history period that and it's apparent the comics have been created and drawn mainstream comics have been drawn for so long by, you know, by generally speaking white dudes. And that was, yeah. you know, and although comics were, you know, a medium invented, you know, by, um, by Jewish people and by Jewish teenagers. And like, you know, in the early days at a time where, you know, Jewish people were facing terrible persecution and discrimination in this country. And so, you know, they, they are the originators of comics as, as a medium in America, but, uh, you know, mainstream comics as we know it, but, you know, moving forward, like comics has certainly not had a, a good record in any way for inclusion until very recently, obviously. Yeah. I mean, to me, you know, I, I don't want listeners to think that this book is where this issue, sorry, this episode is like a condemnation of, the, you know, like the white creators and stuff like that who've done comics. Because obviously, you know, 
I love those guys, like all those guys, Byrne and Neil Adams and Marshall Rogers and Terry Austin. And I mean, just just all the people who are the luminaries that we all think about when we think about comics from 70s and 80s and 90s. I love all those guys. It doesn't matter if they're black, white, Hispanic or you're East Asian or, or whatever the hell it is. I just feel that it's it's acutely a crime that this guy whose work is so stellar i mean it's so stellar and he's so like untalked about is uh and you can just sense in his in his own interviews that it's the racism you know like the the, like the chair incident like the chair incident if that happens to a white guy it doesn't mean anything you know because white guys play pranks like that but when you play a prank on for lack of a better term, the token black guy at your company and those kind of like humiliation pranks, which are, you know, like these frat boy things, those things kind of, I, I, I don't know if they build bonds, but they kind of like make a sense of camaraderie. But also you always kind of carry that nickname, you know, like something dumb happens to you with your frat, you know, you, you know, in college, they're always going to know you by the nickname that, you know, that comes out of there from you. And that's, and that might be okay for when you're in college, but say five years later and you run into them and they still call you by that stupid nickname, you've kind of outgrown it. And if you haven't outgrown it, then, I mean, I mean, you've outgrown it. And if they don't, and if, and if they don't respect that you've outgrown it, those people are people that you don't want in your life, you know, because they, they haven't recognized that you've grown as a human being. The thing is for a prank like this to happen at like, like in your career, he would never be able to out to out to outgrow that at DC, you know, and at Marvel, because it was such, it's, it's such a small community and it's such a small community, particularly even then just among like all comic part, because it was, it wasn't like, there's was just those two comics. Like we said earlier in the beginning of this podcast, like gold key had shut down. There was no more Charlton. You know, there was some Archie stuff, but they were just doing digest shit. So it was, it, the, it, the industry had contracted so much and which means that there's, it becomes this, this more and more of, of like this boys club kind of thing. Yeah, and totally. I mean, yeah, so 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 there's no way he can escape that kind of public shaming that is unwarranted, and therefore he doesn't do any work, you know, which is truly sad. I mean, it, it'd be kind of like if, you know, um, who would it be like someone who didn't do any work, like, you know, uh, who took a while? I mean, it'd be kind of like, I mean. You know, what if John Byrne quit the industry after he did X Men? Yeah, you know, right? He'd be like, "What? Like, what happened to this guy?" Yeah, exactly. Like, he's, that, he's that good, and he doesn't do any more work. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Um, or Frank Miller quit after he did Daredevil. I mean, yes, he did a great run on Daredevil, fantastic run. But if he quits after Daredevil, there's no Ronin, there's no Dark Knight Returns, there's no Batman Year One, there's no Sin City, you know, there's no Three Hundred. There's no like a lot of shit that like he's really truly famous for, um, and I think that's what happened with Trevor. So and it's it's so true everything you're saying, and it's it's uh, a a very depressing theme that I think we're unfortunately going to be revisiting quite a bit on this podcast of brilliant comic artists uh, who were who were black artists in the '80s who either dropped out of comics or just didn't get the love that they deserved considering the caliber of their work. And like, you know, when we talk about alien Legion, it'll be a similar discussion in some sense about Larry Stroman, Larry Stroman, who I think was a a shining light artistically and kind of in the mold of like a, a Walter Simonson meets meets. I don't know who in terms of stylistic influences, but Stroman's work was so bold and original and singular and just really incredibly sophisticated just gorgeous work on Alien Legion and then later X Factor and then, of course, his own tribe. But Larry Stroman ended up quitting comics and becoming a security guard for like over a decade, I think maybe even like 15 years or something. And that is such a just horrific tragedy for for comics that someone as great as Larry Stroman, you know, decides to leave the business and and go do some work like that where it's like, God damn, this guy's a fucking incredible yeah. artist. What's going on with this industry? Jesus. It's, 
you say that he's like I, I almost feel like he's a blend of like Walter Simonson and like a tad of the explosiveness of Bill Sienkiewicz. Mm. Not the same kind of line work. Yeah, I like can see that. that. But yeah, that yeah. Kind of like the, it's kind of like it jumps off the page. But I mean, it's you know we'll we'll, we'll get to that when we do when we do an allegiance. But yeah, I mean it's like I mean the thing is that these guys don't suffer from like a drug problem, you know, cause there's always this thing like, um, uh, you know, like Sam Jackson, maybe it's not Sam Jackson, but it's either Sam Jackson or Morgan Freeman. Like, I think, yeah, like Morgan Freeman was on, um, Sam, Sesame Sam had a problem in the seventies. Okay. Right? I was, oh, I was going to say Sam, Sam yeah, definitely. Sam, he was, had a drug well, problem too. Yeah. And, and Morgan Freeman, he got, I, I want to say he got caught up in the, the heroin thing. Hmm. And and he basically missed like ten years of his career. It wasn't until he did a movie with um, uh, he played this character named Fast Black in this uh movie with um Christopher Reeves, like one of Christopher Reeves' last movie. And like and he, I mean, he basically missed ten, fifteen years of his career because of a drug problem. And it's like that's that's tragic, but not nearly as tragic as I'm quitting, like Larry Stroman, you know. Um, I didn't realize that. I, I didn't. I didn't know that about Morgan Freeman. That's crazy. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, because you know, because think about it, right? He doesn't. He, he plays that role of that pimp in that movie, and um, oh, it's called Street Smart, and which everybody should see if they haven't seen it. So it's a great Christopher. Ro- it's, a, it's one of those movies that Christopher Reeves did that you realize that if he hadn't done Superman. He would have. I mean, he he was a really talented actor who got so typecast that that he didn't have a lot of chance to do things. But um, yeah. But speaking of like drug dealers and being black and this pressures of being artists, did you hear about about Michael K. Williams? That's how he died. Yeah, yeah. It's really sad. You know, it's really like sad. apparently he had he had cocaine that was laced with fentanyl. Yeah. And I was like, at fifty some years old, you're doing cocaine yeah. because the 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 pressures. The I mean, you had a lot of success too. The the rigors of being an artist is not is crazy. Yeah, um, yeah, it's really wow. sad. It's wow. Yeah. Um, goodness. Uh, yeah. There's so um, much to say about this. Is there? Are, so are there any other things that you wanted about, to make sure we touched on today? Because um, our, our connection book, seems like it's I mean, a little yes, bit wonky right now. So I'm, a, I'm a, but wanting to make sure we wrap up and get this uh, get the recording wrap before read. we lose it. Just for the sheer delight about what you can do. Because like like nowadays, there's more freedom with the type of stuff you can do as, a, as an artist, as a writer, how you're telling stories in comics, and primarily because because Vertigo opened up those doors. But this is a guy's work that you could look at it if you're a writer or an artist and see like some new ways to, to help you tell story and to do different stories and to, and, and to push the envelope. You'll, you'll, you'll find a, you'll be inspired to do your own work, to push it by looking at this guy's work. And I think that's like the ultimate compliment that we can play, that, that we can pay Trevor is that it's 30 years later, 40 years later almost. And it's, it's still, is inspiring it's still all inspiring yeah you know because it's like fuck man like yeah. how'd you come up with this shit? yeah man how'd you come up with yeah that? that's so well put chris that's exactly what i'm finding in trevor's work and i told you before like i'm on like a an ebay quest right now to get every single comic that trevor von eden has ever done and i'm starting with all this stuff in the 80s that i'm so in love with right now and just every piece of trevor's work that i find is like each one is like this magical artifact where he's trying out new methods, new tools, new ways of storytelling and arranging panels and drawing on a page. Like they're all so invigorating to look to look at just, you know, and it's so rare to find an artist where you can just pick up a piece of their work and be instantly inspired. Right. Because it's that good. And that's what Von Eden's work is like. And it's it's just such a high bar for art. It's so rare to find an artist where any piece of their work that you can find is so inspiring because it's just hit me, as I've been saying this whole episode with a ton of bricks lately that uh, 
Trevor Eden is a goddamn genius and every piece of work he did specifically in the 80s, because I've been going chronologically through his work and that's where I'm at right now. All the work I've seen from him in the 80s is breathtaking. So I've been tracking down all these little individual issues he did, fill in issues on DC Comics books like Vigilante, Batman and the Outsiders, the regular Batman book, Batman Annual, all that stuff, World's Finest, and every single thing that that I find that I'm just buying off eBay that Trevor did every fucking book, Chris is like a revelation. Every book is so exciting to look at. It's just like this jolt of adrenaline that inspires you to go to want to make cool shit. Cause you're like, look at this guy, look at the fucking stuff he's doing that no one's ever done before. Just on this like fucking fill in issue on Batman and the outsiders. And he's just killing it. Just, just murdering it. Just so amazing with the work that it's just truly inspiring for any kind of creative person where it's like, it doesn't matter what the gig is. It doesn't matter what the opportunity is. You got a chance to fucking strut your stuff and like do something that no one's ever done before. And in that respect, Trevor Von Eden is a rare inspiration. So yeah, so honestly, it's been my biggest joy in comics recently is just discovering that I can use eBay on my phone to fucking give myself a, a little treat of a new Von Eden comic every few days. And yeah, man, it puts a puts a battery in your back, keeps you going. Well, I, I was telling you, as we were recording this, I was getting, I was putting in my bed <laughs> first and stuff. Yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, I, I mean like, while we were down with the checklist, I was, I was getting that, that, uh, that Green Arrow series. <laughs> That's so, dope. Um, I mean, yeah, because it's like, it's 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 hard. I mean, we've been seeing it for the last three hours. How <laughs> dope this guy's art is! How how revolutionary and experimental it is! I, I think ultimately that might be what I find so fascinating is that it is experimental. And I think that when you get to experiment the way this guy's doing in a medium that is very specific about what works, what doesn't work for the uh you know for the audience to digest and even like that's what Heidi McDonald was saying like that one page that was like that weird s kind of thing like it looks kind of like a board game like like that game life or something like that where you're trying to follow on some weird s which is mm. not the way you would want to think about doing no comic panels but he made it work um but that's where the guy's a genius and that is why if, if you've gone through this thing please go and get on eBay get his stuff read his stuff champion his stuff Yes, um, absolutely. 100%. I don't know uh, if Trevor is selling his own work through his own website or anything like that at this point. But obviously, we would encourage everyone to go to Trevor's website as well. If he's got one out there, I haven't even looked right now. But, um, you know, Trevor Von Eden, uh, any way that uh, people want to support him and check out his work, please do so because uh, the guy has a rare gift and he's a once in a lifetime talent in the world of comic books. So... That is our episode on Thriller, Trevor Von Eden, and Robert Lauren Fleming. Uh, we will be back next week with a new series to talk about. What that is, <laughs> you'll have to tune in and see. We'll keep it a surprise until you see it. Yeah. All right, Steve. Um, All right, that's this Chris. week. We will yep. uh, uh, pick it up as soon as we can with the next stuff. And there it is. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so the thriller episode is actually not over. We actually have something else that we want to get back to you guys with. We recorded the episode and then we came across an article in the comics journal. I think it's issue 100. I'm not sure if that's right, Steve. Is that's it right. issue 100? Yep. yep, it is. Um, where there's an interview by, um, an interview conducted by Heidi McDonald of Dick Giordano, who was, you know, uh, he was he was an inker and he was a, and he inked some of these issues of Thriller, but he was like a big wig kind of like was he like a he's not the editor in chief but he's he was the uh, vice president and executive editor at DC Comics right and, at the time uh, uh, yeah and he was he was responsible as it says here at the top of the interview uh, for instituting changes that have slowly changed DC's formerly stodgy public image into a more vital one. And as Giordano mentions in this interview, it's his willingness to take chances, like dropping the uh, Comics Code seal of approval on Swamp Thing, for example, uh, that are helping to shake DC up these days. And in this interview, he speaks candidly about his uh, successes as well as his failures uh, during his tenure at the company. Yeah, so, uh, and, we, and we want to talk about this because he did talk about Thriller in this 
um, is in this interview mainly because what we think is because Heidi McDonald, she gave a, such a glowing review of Thriller, and now she gets to talk to the guy who was behind it, uh, uh, you know, or he was he was one of the chief people behind it from the from the editorial department, um, and and these are his candid thoughts. Um, the main thing he says is. He wishes that he could take this back. He wishes that it never it never came out. Yeah, this is this never is actually shocking. Came out. This is really truly shocking considering the episode that we've already recorded where we just fucking fall all over ourselves rightly praising this book to the high heavens. It's kind of insane to actually realize the perception that existed Chris for Thriller behind the scenes amongst the uh, the higher ups at DC. So, OK, I guess before we comment on it, let me just read the exchange that Heidi has with Dick about the book, because it's short, but I think it is very revealing. So uh, so she says, uh, it seems like uh, DC's Baxter books, which, as you know, Chris, but for the listeners, the, the Baxter format was a new fancy kind of paper that DC had introduced. Uh, right. It seems that DC's Baxter books, as well as the hardcover, softcover plan, whatever that was, uh, have been successful. And and there was Thriller, which was a strange, wonderful experiment. All right. So that's what Heidi says. And here's what Dick says in response. I characterize it as a noble experiment. I see it in the same way you do. I really do wish I had that one back to be honest with you, because the concept was wonderful. I have to accept the blame for what went wrong with Thriller, because I allowed two people to work together who probably shouldn't have. They were young and inexperienced, and I had problems with the two of them, Robert Lauren Fleming and Trevor Von Eden. I had problems with the two of them from the beginning. I don't mean that in a way to diminish either of them as talents. But as a team, it didn't work. Individually, both Trevor and Bob are very talented people, and they both had a vision of what Thriller should be, but unfortunately, it wasn't the same vision. And at a time when I was in a position to do something, I was too busy with something else, and I didn't. And at another time when I could have done something, I handed it, I handed it over to another editor, Alan Gold, and stuck him with a problem that was really impossible for an editor with his background to be able to solve. He'd been a comics fan for years, but his background was in book publishing. I guess I did everything wrong that I could have done wrong. We even positioned it wrong. Naturally, if you read the early issues, you could see that it was a superhero team without costumes, but it was never positioned as a superhero team. And perhaps it should have been. From a sales standpoint, it might have made a difference. However, creatively, it didn't attain the goal I had set for it. I wish I had it back. Heidi McDonald responds and says simply, I enjoyed it. There were parts of it I enjoyed very much. Giordano responds, There were little bits of brilliance throughout. With the proper guidance, it could have been a brilliant series. I'm really sorry it went down the tubes. <laughs> no, it's crazy because okay, because let That's me insane. tell you, That's totally insane. insane. But let me tell you, he is right. There is genius in that book. I'm not saying the book. The book is trouble. That's for sure. But there's there's more than like there's more than flashes of genius. I mean, like dude's art, Trevor Von Eden's art is insane. It is so ahead of his time. It's so wild. The concept is a little strange. I think that's all that it is. Um, it's, it, it that's a book that would be strange for today, but we, yeah. but, but, but we talked about it like, 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 like we talked about it earlier in this episode of how crazy, how insane, how impressive the book was, how emotional the book was. And I feel like it's interesting that he says that Alan Gold, he was a book publisher. So he had, so he had no experience really working with trying to meld an artist and a writer. And then I, that to me is what it sounds like was that what was the problem. But yes. it's interesting because he talks about throughout the book, throughout the interview, that there's never enough. There was never, he said they were spread thin so much. And I feel like it's interesting as like a reader to think about 
what was the size of like the the editorial staff at Marvel in the eight early eighties and DC in the early eighties? Where does and then you think about how many how many books they're putting out, but then maybe there's only like you know five or six editors and they're like overworked to no to no end, and then you have and then obviously books like Batman and Spider Man and you know Iron Man like the like the mainstays those are probably pretty easy to edit. Well, you get something like, but but you realize that he's saying that they were like trying to experiment, like Dick and Jeanette Kahn were like really trying to. He made some comment where, where that he was trying to erase the stigma that, that they were considered like the Wall Street Journal. Yes, of, yeah, that was fascinating. Of the uh, of the uh, the uh, the whatever the Wall Street Journal of the comics thing, and I was like, oh, so you're like some stodgy. It's all by the book. We don't do anything cool. And honestly, if you think about DC in the late 70s through this early 80 period, 82, 83, something like that, it's not that exciting compared to what Marvel's doing at the same time. Because at yeah. the same time that like that's the launch of the that's the launch of the Wolverine X Men the Claremont X Men that's when Burn is like is going to speed that's when like Frank Miller is growing up that's when like what that's when George Perez is still at Marvel there's all this cool stuff going on at Marvel and there's nobody going on cool at DC like he said the only thing that was cool at DC that'd be cool but he was like um there was like a uh somebody was doing something with Batman with like somebody and like Jim Apero. And he, and he was saying, Oh, it was, um, it was Batman and the outsiders. Cause I remember that in the interview. He oh, said, right. Jim, yeah, Jim Aparo and Mike W. Barr were Mike doing w. Batman Barr. and the outsiders. Yeah, And he was saying that like, Oh, well, you know, it's funny because like, cause Jim, cause Jim Aparo, he's a great artist. He's an amazing artist. I but, love Jim Aparo. But he was saying, that he he had no fan base. The fans didn't really like him. And I was like, that's interesting to even consider that. But then I don't think about his art is his art is very um it's not flashy. It's not no. flashy at all. It's great work, great storytelling, great like everything, panel layouts, like just like yeah. everything you want from an artist he's doing but he's just not flashy the way it you're right craftsmanship it's like yeah. total craftsmanship masterful comic booking but absolutely not flashy yeah i mean and i and and, and i mean to a degree it's kind of like he's not like an artist artist he's like a he's a he's a craftsman artist you know like you know what i'm saying like in terms of like he knows how to do everything well but it's but he doesn't imbue the work with the level of like whoa and if because if you think he's he, it's like he's he's blown up at the same time that Miller and Byrne and Perez are killing it, and I mean and, he, and he's their contemporary and he's never mentioned, you know. Yeah, Aparo. Like, yeah, I think Aparo technically was a bit older than those guys, but you're right; he was still doing major books at the same time during their period. I think technically he was a generation older, but it's just. He had been in that same position in the business, though, I think throughout his whole career where he yeah. was always, always the craftsman and always like the solid workhorse artist who never was heralded as like a superstar. I happen to love Jim Aparo because Batman and the Outsiders was one of the first comic books I ever bought. And so his work to me is like absolute classic, like the peak of what Batman's supposed to look like in my mind. So True. I, ad True. I adore I adore his work. But, uh, you know. I think it's true, you know, what you're saying is like he never popped as like a superstar. He was just a really humble guy. And I think I even read like a an editorial that Denny O'Neill wrote once about Jim Aparo that sticks in my head. And he talked about how Aparo was just the most humble, modest dude. And he did not want publicity. He didn't want to be praised. He just did his work on time, came in, dropped it off, and was not a guy who needed to be famous in any kind of way. And, you know, that's commendable. And he had, you know, many, many decades of solid work. But I think he probably exemplified the kind of work that DC was known for, like you're saying here, the image they were trying to shake as like the uh, stodgy comics company that was like your dad's comics company. And in a way, it's like if you look at the 60s, that's the birth of the Marvel comics we know. You could say Marvel won the 60s between Marvel and DC. And I think you're probably right too, Chris. Like Marvel won the 70s because Marvel had a lot of exciting shit happening in the 70s too. But I think for me, for my money, if you want to stick it into like a binary, 
you know, I, I'd say DC won the 80s because DC for me just really did explode as we've been talking about with just an unbelievable amount of experimentation and risk in the 80s. But you're absolutely right. And I feel that part of it has to do with what Dick Giordano was saying in his article and what about Jeanette Kahn, because he's talking about how part of his bonus is tied to, you know, that they gave him all this extra money because he was taking risks being creative. That to me is interesting about, you know, I think I think that might be why the thriller thing, like he's got such a bad taste in his mouth because he was like, this could have been more money for me, not just for the company, but for me, because, and, and it didn't work out right. Um, it's interesting that he doesn't like it. And and I, it also explains why he came in to ink it, because it's like, oh, yes. you know what? I got to try to write this ship somehow. I got to save this. Yep. I, I got to save this, because you, you know what? It's my money. Now you're messing with my money. Um I don't know. It's a very interesting article. I, I think everyone should kind of – because he talks about like how he, you know, he put in – the stuff about you know, the contract and the DC contract about the royalties and about getting your art back. And there was all this kind of stuff that you can go, Oh, this is what the, the like Marvel was doing at a handshake. And that's why like, later on you have those, like the, like those people are suing Marvel, you know, there's all that the cartoonist kayfabe stuff where they're getting like these court transcripts because Marvel is cheating everyone. I don't think they're cheating everyone, but they weren't, they were doing everybody dirty in a way because they were doing these handshake deals and and it's, and Dick was like, we're gonna do it, put it all in writing, so there's no like, there's no, there's, so, so everyone knows what they're doing. I mean, he said in the book, he said that they had contracted Frank Miller to do three Batman graphic novels, and I'm like, he only did the one, he only did the Dark Knight. Uh-huh. So that's fascinating. Well, he did. I wonder if Batman Year One was considered one of those. That's true, but also doesn't mean that like. You know that contract. Like, how long does that last? Like, he was saying that he was saying again that the Marvel contract, well, these things for life. And he's like, the con- the DC stuff was, was it was gonna be f- like for the work you were gonna do. So I'm I'm wondering if those other two, you know, there's those sequels to Dark Knight, right? Like, if right. those are if those are actually him like fulfilling that contract. Like, oh, that would be 30, wild. Forty years later, decades you know? later, that would be insane. I mean, it's possible that that's what that is. So. uh I don't know, but I feel like I feel like he Dick has a his a uh, his his um his assessment of thriller is maybe more like you know it's kind of like he knew it could have been cool, and because he took his eye off of it, I think it hurts him more. It just feels like it hurts him more because yeah. he was but he was saying in the article too about how like the Omega man was too violent in the beginning, that book. And he just has to be, he's an interesting kind of comments. He was like, Oh, even yeah. vigilante was too violent at first. And then it calmed down. And I was like, Oh, you guys have to be told them to calm that shit down. You yeah. know, not like they yeah. just decided to. Yeah. Um, I love it. I, it's a very honest interview. You yeah. know, like yeah. you don't hear editors who are active editors at any company talking with this degree of candidness and frankness about stuff like, you know, these days, like this is a very honest interview. And there's one other point in it where Thriller is brought up a few questions later. They veer off into some other topics. And then uh, Heidi comes back and says, uh, DC says, uh, or I'm sorry, Dick says, uh, some of the more radical things that DC has planned will be happening toward the end of this year, the beginning of next year. And then Heidi McDonald says, so we will be seeing more experimental things. Giordano, oh yeah, most of the people here felt that Thriller was a worthwhile experiment, although it didn't sell, but it did show our willingness to take some chances. As a matter of fact, and this is the part you referenced, Chris, when I received my bonus, one of the things that was said to me was that the reason for the size of the bonus was that I was willing to take chances. That says the company's willing to reward me when DC takes chances, um, which which is very important. It's a very important thing to say. And, and then he goes into the whole Wall Street Journal, blah, blah, blah. But uh, he goes on to say, I feel comfortable with Jeanette Kahn, with Paul Levitz and with Joe Orlando, the people that I work with most. We all seem to be of a like mind. Paul doesn't want to spend all the money that I spend, but when push comes to shove, he wants to try something to help break down our image. So again, back to the image. Like, I think this really must have been just a huge thing 
on the mind of all the higher ups at DC. We've got to stop being perceived as this dodgy, boring comics company that's like your dad's company. You know, Marvel's been hip and edgy and we want to be something that can compete with Marvel. And I mean, props to Jeanette Kahn, like I always say constantly for being the one running the show here and willing to take so many chances during her tenure, because obviously it paid off with Thriller and, and with so many books in this era. Well, there's the thing Well, he says in the book, too, in the interview, he says that, you know, the Jeanette Kahn, she came from a place in publishing where they really took care of the creative people. And and she was like, because without that, you don't have the books. And I feel like I feel like they because Jeanette Kahn, what she started in like the late 70s, like 78 or 79 yeah. or something like that. Right. So yeah. that, this is like maybe like five, six years into her run. This is probably after her first her first contract over. This is this is after her contract renewal. I'm just speculating. I don't know. Yeah. But <laughs> I'm assuming this is now she's on her second contract um if not third um and it's like she's like what can we because the thing is like we were saying earlier you know that marvel there was like marvel and d like marvel was the shit there's a really really great business wars uh podcast which i'll put we'll, we'll put a link to in the show notes where it's called marvel versus dc and it just kind of like shows the history of their um, of their rivalry and how it started and what it was like. And for years, over a decade, the people, like all through the 60s, the people at DC, the higher-ups were just kind of like, that Marvel shit is bullshit. Like, the, they, they just were like not liking it at all. And uh, and it just, and you could, and you saw what happened with the rise of the, like, the, there was some article I read somewhere else too that like, part of the reason why it's really hard to find a lot of like, like early Marvel uh comics like the back issues of like the that oh, that original stuff in the 60s is that dc was in control of the distribution of marvel comics and they kind of shorted them to like newsstands and stuff like this and just kind of fucked their sales because they were trying to like not let them really compete but so they knew they were getting their asses kicked but they couldn't figure out why yeah and it was just like you know people in charge and then eventually that all went away, and 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 obviously, like you said, like the the eighties and the eighties changed DC, and you all these people talk about like you know, are you a Marvel head or you're a DC head, and why? When I think when they think about DC heads, they think about the DC from the seventies and the sixties. Right. When they think about like you know, when it's like you know, S S Jimmy Olsen, Superman's best friend, and <laughs> shit like that, you know, and and like the super super. And now look. I love that series, the, the Legion of Superheroes. But when it's called Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes, it was kind of like, it was kind of, I, 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 it was kind of cheesy. It wasn't until like Paul Levitz got in and Keith Giffen started, those guys started doing it in the 80s differently. They got rid of the, the Superboy thing and they said, we're just going to do it like this. And it was became much better. Like you saw, you think about it, if you go back and look at some of those books, those, those longer running books like that, like, Legion was a book that people loved it, and that's oh, yeah. one, that one episode of of uh, of Rob Servations where he said that they fucked themselves with that five year later thing because it was such a really really well written crafted. It was probably the best team book. Tis like the number of the number of players to be able to juggle all that shit. The mythology like it's way it's way more complicated than more than X Men and stuff like that. And apparently, it was selling in the same. The same like volume as it was a rival of X Men, yeah. Like, until, until they kind of fucked it. Well, the, well, at first they made it a Baxter book in like the mid uh, mid eighties, which means now they cut the sales on it to a degree because it was like one twenty five when other books were like seventy five to sixty cents. And then they did that one experiment thing with the five years later, which I personally think is genius storytelling, absolutely genius storytelling. Mm -hmm. But it's so counter to what. <laughs> you would do i mean it's i mean like marvel did it a little bit with like that series called like um um old man logan and sure. it's essentially like if you took days of future past and just said here's where we are now and it's like i mean it, it's it's such a radical jump of what everyone was used to that it just they just people never got back on board with it and i think that was um, but again, that's DC willing to experiment. It's willing to like shake things up and do things differently. You know, I mean, we talked about this before, uh, books like Atari force 
And he even mentions that there was like that li- they had made all this licensing money. There, and it was like an Atari force had to be like a license deal. Um, it's just interesting to see where they were at this point. Because in 85, he, like he's talking like crisis is just coming out. This oh, is, yeah. This is pre uh, uh, Dark Knight. He's talking about they just hired Alan Moore. So it's yeah. pre, this is pre Watchmen, too. Oh, so it's yeah. Pre- interesting moment where he's like saying we got some cool shit getting ready to happen we just can't tell you what it is yet you know yeah that's what's so fascinating about reading giordano's um interviews and public statements during this period because he was right there at the the center of all this and even some of those like meanwhile columns that we've read uh, a few of chris um in discussing other books on the show i remember there was a meanwhile column that giordano wrote uh which was of course the monthly column he wrote in all the DC books. And in one of them, he was talking about like, yeah, we got this new Batman book by Frank Miller. It's got an old Batman in it. It's going to be really interesting. I think it's going to be something really special. And you hear him just talking about his first impressions of Dark Knight, his first impressions of Watchmen as the pages are coming in. And it's such a fascinating glimpse behind the scenes at this incredibly historic moment. And so speaking of that, Let me just briefly read the passage here in the interview where Giordano talks about Alan Moore and more funny. Yeah, this is really good. And more broadly, just all the British talent. And this kind of gives a little insight into how the British invasion happened at DC Comics. So um, Heidi is talking here and she says, so uh, sales on Swamp Thing are picking up, right? Giordano. Oh, definitely. Sales in the direct sales shops alone have increased by 50%. We're not sure about newsstands yet. It takes a little bit more time to find out about them. But since the activity on the newsstands often mirrors that in the direct sales shops, I suspect sales have gone up there too. I'm kind of playing cards. I say, okay, we have we have to make this book sell better. Let's take a chance. Let's not, let's not go for the obvious. Uh, in an upcoming Meanwhile column, I mention that we read 2000 AD here, which is the British comic book, and I've always liked Alan Moore's work in there. Maybe it was Paul Levitz's idea. I forget whose it was. But Paul said, look, we've run out of possibilities here. Let's start looking elsewhere. So we took a chance. We called Alan Moore, and he was interested. He wrote a 16-page letter, single-spaced. I really wish everybody in this country could read something that he writes, not only the comic books, but the letters that come with them, because they're works of art in themselves. In this 16-page letter, he outlined who the Swamp Thing was and what kind of stories he would write. And I've never seen anything more accurate in my life. We passed it around the office. It's encouraged us with the rest of the English artists and writers, and you're going to see a lot more of them in the next few months. We need people who can do work now. And the British seem to be ready to do work now. The rate of exchange has been a great asset to us, incidentally. They usually make more money working there than they do here. But with the rate of exchange being what it is, and with the way we've increased our rates, we've increased our rates something like 40 or 50% in the last four years. It's made a big difference in being able to attract the top talent from overseas. And then uh, Heidi McDonald responds, you enjoy taking chances. And Giordano says, I'm willing to do it any old time. I've taken chances on people. Maybe I shouldn't have taken them on like young people who walk through the door. If I feel there's some possibility of a win, I'll take a shot at it. The advantages outweigh the risks in most cases. I don't want to aim for the status quo. And I'm willing to strike out once in a while, as long as there's that chance of striking pay dirt once in a while, too. I think you'll agree that one Alan Moore is worth three writers who went down the tubes because they took chances. See, that's fascinating because I can't, I mean, like, I don't understand the the thing about the exchange rate because at that time, like the British pound has always been so much stronger than the U.S. dollar. But maybe he's talking about like but he said the page. I mean, look, I that has to be the reason why, like Byrne left to do, you know, Byrne and Miller left Marvel to do this work at DC because if they're if they raised their rates fifty percent, I mean that's like huge money and that's. But it's interesting yeah. how how Paul Lois is like, oh, there's nobody here who who's good. He's just to say there's <laughs> no. nobody here who's good. Yeah. 
So let's go find someone elsewhere. I was like, God damn. But, but, but Nobody in America. That, yeah, but, but maybe it sheds light as to why, like, all those British guys all worked at DC, you know, like Gaiman and, you know, I mean, I mean mo- like, those guys don't really have, like, much of a Marvel presence, you know? Again, oh, it could I mean, be. Grant, Grant Morrison, you know, like, Peter Milligan, Garth Ennis. I mean, for a long time, very few of them had worked at Marvel. They were all at DC forever. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think it has to do with the fact that, A, he, like, like, like Dick was saying that, the deal, the contracts were for the for whatever series you were working on, what book, not like we just have you. And I feel those guys are like we're, you're not just going to have us like that because yeah. we're not we live here. Um, but but at the same, I, I don't know. It's interesting to to I mean, it's interesting to ask those guys what was it like? This is eighty five, right? So it's like in four years is when you launched the Vertigo line, and it's like in a, it's what it's in two years from now. In time frame is when like Screamer comes out, and you know which is which is a book we talk about later on, and you just kind of think about oh these guys are like they're, they're laying the groundwork now to like and it all kind of yes. stems with Alan Moore and 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 what we know obviously is is that the the creative community in England is much smaller and they're having and they know each other in the way that they they might not hear because this is the size of the industry and the size of the country and the size of like who's doing creative work it's just so much smaller there's no way you wouldn't be able to run so like the whole small town mentality about um uh uh you know uh it's like if we say here in Hollywood all the time, it's such a small town. Speaking of which, you, you know, they mentioned that he's a um he wrote the sixteen page sixteen page uh, uh um the letter, letter thing. I was, we had someone on the rant room, uh, our friend Fonz. Uh, he was talking about his first job when he came out. Of, well, like he won something and he was working for Noah Hawley, and he did his mm, show for Fargo. Noah Fargo dude. Yeah, for Hargo. Before it was way before Fargo. He had a hmm. show at um ABC or something like that. And I, I I meant to look this up, but he was saying that he knew that that Noah was a crazy fucking dude because there was some actor or some actress that he wanted in his show that I don't think went or maybe it did go over. I can't, I, I can look it all up, but he, but he wrote a 30, like a, I don't know, like a 15 or 30 page like letter to the studio head about wow. why I want this actress and why this type of actress doesn't exist anymore. Like, like reversing someone from, I can look at, we did it maybe a couple months ago, but I thought it was fascinating that like people actually do that. People actually write these, these like, you know, these essays, these, you know, these, these, these pleas mm-hmm. to the money people do something cool. And <laughs> if you're a good writer, if you're a really good writer, then you can convince people because it's like I was telling you before, you know, like I'm working on a project now and I'm trying to get this big author to give me some life rights to his stuff. And I had got a copy of the letter that the guy who directed that movie called Room, that thing that kicked off Brie Larson's career, really kicked off her right. career, that movie. And he wrote this five page letter to the author that I got a copy of. And it's mm. such a fascinating, like just a piece of work, like, oh, this is what you could do. Like you could write something like this and get someone to give you the rights to their work because she didn't want to give that the rights to that book up to make a movie. She thought someone was going to fuck it up, but he like just wrote it in a very like personal, tangible, convince you to give me your shit kind of way. But he never mentioned, <laughs> it, but he never mentioned money or, or anything like that. He just like said, this is what it means to me. And this is why I think we could do this. It's interesting that, people do that. And I didn't know that someone did in the comic industry, but here's someone who did it, you know? So. Yeah, um, that is actually super, super fascinating. Actually, please uh, send me that, that room letter. I'm curious to read that after hearing you talk about it. Um, I would love to read that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is really all super fascinating just to realize where the roots of the, the British invasion at DC where, where it was all coming from, you know, and Levitz and Giordano having these conversations. And it's cool that you mentioned Screamer, Chris, cause you're right. When we think about the creative team on Screamer, who are those guys? Pete Milligan, Steve Dillon, Brett Ewins, they're all 2000 AD folks, yeah. you know, they're all okay. alumni, you know, of 2000 AD. And, uh, you know, they also started at least, um, uh, Dillon and 
Ewan started uh, Deadline Magazine, another huge comics magazine over in England. And like you say, a small community of artists who were constantly working together. And so when Alan Moore breaks through here in such dramatic fashion, you can see Giordano says it right here. Basically, Alan Moore opened up the floodgates. Like when yeah. things went so well with Alan, we we decided we wanted to go get a whole bunch more British talent. And and that, you know, does open the floodgates for so many writers um, you know, your Grant Morrison's, your Jamie Delano's, um, just so many yeah, yeah, wonderful Jamie, writers. Got, got, Damon. Um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Nye Reber, I forget his name. What's his first name, the guy? Was he, was he English? I never knew much about that dude. I, was, I, uh, I, I think he had to be because... <laughs> he wrote you know, so because, many Vertigo books. <laughs> yeah. well, he wrote Vertigo books, but I feel like for him, for, 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 for Neil Gaiman to give him the books of magic thing, like he, he had to have known him. He certainly, you know, if not, if not, he certainly had that vibe. <laughs> but also, people who have those triple names like that, you know, they're usually <laughs> fucking British. I don't know anyone. In, I mean, not too many American writers are using their middle name as part of their damn their name. I, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being whatever by it, or whatever. I'm just <laughs> Some weird, I, I, I don't know, some weird stereotypes. But a Brit, it was a British guy who told me that one time. A British guy like was saying that. One oh, time. Was like, oh, oh, he's up, oh, he's up okay. across having that name like that. I, I, I gotta, I gotta say for just for uh, for the record, since you said it, John Nye Ryber apparently is an American comic writer. Oh, okay, he's American. Okay, there he's it is. American. There it is. He's American. Uh, he is uh, from. Let's see, where is he from? Does Wikipedia say uh, they got him listed as American? doesn't say where he was born but according to wikipedia he's an american comic writer but i i would have you know i would have been not sure what to guess either honestly i never never heard much about that guy he wrote a lot of books but i don't isn't I don't really what's his name british though uh barry windsor smith oh yeah he is barry windsor smith is is british although he was like a he was an english dude who came over and lived in america i think from a fairly young age if i recall but i believe but, but, yeah but, well, but if but if you remember, he was gone just by Barry Smith for a while. That's true. And, then he went to the yeah. third name. Yeah, and then he added, and then he added the Windsor. Because... <laughs> that's, that's when he really, <laughs> when he really became great. <laughs> no, he, he was always great. But uh, um, no, yeah, is it just well, no? This, I, it's, I, I don't know. I kind of feel. Uh, I still think back to Thriller. I still think he. I wonder what he would have said 20 years later about Thriller. Yeah, it's a good question because this is in the immediate aftermath of Thriller. And, you know, sometimes when something fails financially, that's an artistic venture. It's really easy for people to be disappointed. And also when it gets cut short and it's an untimely demise for the book. And, you know, one of the writers like or the writer himself, I believe, you know, he was asked to leave the book by the editor or whatnot. There was all that conflict there with Alan Gold that we detailed earlier in the episode. And then um, Trevor Von Eden quits the book, you know, not feeling good, not feeling happy after the next issue. So all of that, I'm sure, had to figure into Dick's sort of feeling that the book was a noble failure in his mind, because I guess when you're inside of something and you've got this vision, obviously, of what you want it to be. He didn't want it to be something where the writer got fired and then the artist quit after six issues or whatever, and then everybody and, and, was yeah, replaced. And this is also the time when I mean he's and, and Trevor's quitting because of that chair incident too. So this is around all that kind of bullshit in the office. I mean, it's interesting because you think about like, you know, like in in your head you kind of think, oh, like there's a lot going on at at DC Comics or Marvel Comics because. Uh, um, they're doing so much work, but then you think about it, it's like it's not like the New York Times. It's not like <laughs> right. it's, not, it's, not, it's not like Time Magazine. Yeah, but, and it's certainly it's but, not really the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> they just no, they no, just no but, but, but in, in terms of like the size of the offices, I mean, and honestly, right. if you think about it, they're actually putting out more material than Time Magazine. But Time Magazine, yeah. he's, got, he's got more of like the editorial staff is a different way. And and then you think about it, you know, those artists aren't there. Those artists are working at home and then they're coming into the office to, to, to kick out. Because you always, we, we, talk, we learned that all these guys used to have studio space together. They would share studio space somewhere in New York or, or you know, like like whatever, like Van Eden and and Miller and and the, and the and Neil Adams and stuff. And then they had those little those spaces where Dennis Cowan, they were hanging out with each other. Kevin. 
Right, but that's not at the DC offices. That's not at the Marvel offices. And I think kind of in at least my mind as a kid, I'm not I'm seeing it the way I've seen some of these comic things from you know or from uh movies and stuff, but this this different. You know, it's probably it's probably like a small it's probably just a small office in like a some like some overstuffed office in some, you know, that there's in, that's in New York in one of those skyscrapers. It's maybe like five rooms, ten rooms, and it's just just to the wall with paper and shit, and just and it's everything crazy. It's not, it's not, it's probably not as like as um, glamorous. It's not as halcyon as, yes. as <laughs> like it, it's definitely not as cool as Stan Lee makes it sound like like in his little Stan soapbox thing. He's like, oh, the great people at Marvel, the bullpen. You kind of think it's like this cool area, but it's probably not that at all. You know, probably mad yeah. at each other. Like fucking, there's no heat yeah. in this office. I don't know. <laughs> No, no, I think you're right, man. I think you're totally right. Anytime I hear reflections from Giordano or Jim Shooter or like any of the people who were like running these offices back then, it's never anywhere near as uh, as just fancy and lavish as I kind of always pictured it as a kid. I think it is right, closer right, right. to the picture you're painting. You know, it's just it was like it was a small ish workspace where everyone was overworked and under under appreciated underpaid but they were doing something they loved and the pressure was high because it's a deadline business and it's brutal i mean the fucking deadlines and comics are monthly that's that's crazy to be producing the amount of work that everyone's producing well i mean he was complaining not complaining but he was pointing out that dc i guess they had missed some deadlines and some stuff recently and they got some like uh, uh some kickback from some of the retailers and stuff like that and in the article he was he was like oh we're not gonna miss it. he had to get up there and publicly say we're not gonna miss any deadlines again i think it's interesting though because you know like when dc had a chance to move out to lost to burbank where they are now where the dc office is like everybody jumped at that chance because it was these new offices. Whereas that the, the place where they were in New York, they'd been in there for like fifty years, and they're like, "Oh, we're tired of this place." And uh, they all were so happy to move out to fucking L.A. and be in that in that one building in Burbank it was all kind of new for them, the D- DC Entertainment Building, and it's like got these vault. I mean, like, look, I've not been there, the actual DC offices, but I know the building that's in. I've been in that 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 building, that Warner Brothers building, and it's like a dope building. And I'm sure they were like, well, I, I don't know. I think Marvel's out here too now. But um, yeah, you know, just, I don't know. So it's an era that's gone. And, and I guess some of them are happy or s- some people probably now probably have got no idea what it was like before. So, um, you know, I mean, and he even, I mean, think about Giordano though. Like, where's he, where's, where's he living if he's got to take like a two hour train ride wow. each way? I think he lived in like work. Connecticut, either Connecticut or Jersey, somewhere in the suburbs. He was living yeah. somewhere, somewhere nice. Yeah, yeah. We're someplace mm-hmm. cheap. Yeah. You know? <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully nice. I like to picture it was very nice. Well, I'm but not he's... saying it was. I'm not saying it was. It was slumlord. But I'm just saying, like, <laughs> compared to living, I'm saying, I mean, he's letting you know I can't afford to live in Manhattan. Uh, mm. I can't do that, do that at all with with the money yeah. I'm making. Gosh, I never and, thought and, about and, that. And, I never thought know, about and, that as a kid. You're right. Yeah, and despite his the big bonus he was he was so he was he was chortling about that's still not good enough <laughs> for him to live in Manhattan. So, I don't mean to diss him, but I'm just saying it just makes you make you makes you wonder about like Manhattan real estate and everything. I mean, but if we hey, particularly, the, particularly the office space, um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. It's interesting to just hear, like you said, somebody there. It's you know what it's like. It's kind of like when movies fail. And people get fired because they don't perform well, but then they become like these cult classics. Exactly. A, yes. It, 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 that doesn't happen anymore now because there's no more videotape. But there was that thing where a movie could like, like a classic example was fucking Blade Runner. I'm I'm sure. I'm sure people's heads rolled when that movie came out, and for the following year, everyone over at Warner Brothers and the Lad Company and everything like that they all got fucking fired. And let go, but then you know, twenty years later, thirty years later, it's this genius thing. This genius. Yeah, it's, what was this guy saying? It's incredible. I was listening to this podcast today called "The Art of the Cut," which I think every person who works in the film industry should listen to. This podcast, "The Art of the Cut," hmm. but they had the guy named Joe. Wall. It's all about. It's, it's an interview with editors, hmm. yeah, film at film and TV hmm. editors. And the guy named Joe Walker, who did Dune, was on there. And he was saying that, like, he also did um, uh, uh, 
uh, Blade Runner 2049. He said, oh, wow. yeah, but like we were doing, and he said we were doing that. This is a great thing. He said, he, a great term. He said, we are walking on sacred carpets cinematically when we were doing the Blade Runner sequel. And I, I was like, that's actually kind of a cool, like, <laughs> you know, like, like description of it. Um, but, I, you know, but you're right. It's like you get too close to it. You know, he was obviously doing really well, Dick Giordano, that is, in terms of, like, his, like, you know, he was saying, like, hey, if I, like, win five out of ten, I'm doing good. If I, if I win, like, one out of ten, the company's fucking, you know, company's not mad, the company's mad at me. I feel like he might have been on a roll with, like, doing really, really well with his experiments. And that project, like, like was maybe is one that didn't do well. And he was like, fuck it. I was betting a thousand. And now this bullshit happens. Or, yeah. you know, or whatever it is, there's probably a blemish on him that he, because he was saying I had these big ideas about what I wanted, like sales wise and numbers wise and everything. And he just couldn't hit it for certain things. And but you know, just I, I don't know, just expectations that they weren't were unfulfilled, and that is why he's not he doesn't feel happy about it. But yeah. as we said, everybody needs to read that book because it's fucking fascinating. <laughs> and fucking Trevor Von Eden, you know, t- schooling people. With his art, and as we said before, people like you know, like you know, like he was supposed to be doing Batman. I mean, we said earlier he's supposed to be doing Batman Year One, and Mazzucchelli, and all these people like, like, like we're borrowing from him, uh, yep. like wholesale, like borrowing, like total influence in a way, you know. Um, I actually yeah. want to, I actually want to hear the kayfabe guys talk about that. I don't know if they would though. If they would do Thriller. They've- and then- They've talked about um, <clears throat> they've talked about Trevor's Batman uh, Batman Annual. They did yeah. a they did a video on the Batman Annual, which is brilliant, and that's the one colored by Lynn Varley. That right. is a gorgeous piece of work. But they have not covered Thriller, as far as I know, on Kayfabe, which is uh, which is weird to me that they haven't, frankly. But um, you know, well, I'm glad you know, we, but... we had the time to cover it at length, which I think you know, I think honestly, it's a book that deserves a lot of discussion, and I'm glad we gave it so much time here. Yeah, because I think just thinking, like thinking about now what we were saying earlier uh, is that, you know, that's why I think kayfabe guys could do an interesting thing because it's like they could talk about, because they always talk about like, oh, this is the line quality of somebody else or this is someone so, you know, like, like they yeah. really break down the art in a way that they know who's this line quality was taken from so-and-so. This is like the Alex Toth type of inking or blah, blah, yeah. blah. And I, I'd love to hear how if they would look at that book and then see you know, like who it influenced afterwards, you know, because we were very clear that we know that it, that it influenced Mazzuchelli. You just look at it, but uh, I wonder who else. I mean, I mean, and just get their opinions on that, but who knows? Oh, totally. You know? Totally. It would be, it would be fascinating. And, you know, um, I think that's really one of my favorite things about comics right now is that we've got such a, an embarrassment of riches when it comes to comics podcasts. And I know like we talked about this, Chris, in, in discussing starting this show, but for me, like, you know, I've spent probably about as much time the last 10 years listening to comics podcasts. Probably I might have even spent more time listening to podcasts some years than I've spent reading comics. And during like the times of my life where I've been too busy to like catch up on all my reading, like it's been amazing to have so many dope podcasts out there to feel like I can still keep somewhat connected with the medium that I love, even if I don't have time to read and I'm stuck driving in a car or traveling, doing whatever. So, you know, shout out to uh, everybody doing uh, a serious comics podcast that's that's out there. Like for me, it's been like, you know, Kayfabe, of course, recently, but historically, 11 o'clock comics, wait, what? Uh, there's this, uh, English comics podcast called silence that I used to really love. Um, there was an Australian comics podcast called non-canonical that I listened to years ago. Um, there was an indie comics podcast called indie, indie spinner rack that was based out of New York years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's been just so many amazing, amazing comics podcasts out there. Word balloon, of course. Um, and you know, I appreciate all of them, you know, and these days, of course, I listen to Rob observations for kicks also, cause his stories are wild and he uh, is fucking wild. I mean, he's wild. He's insane. I love there's it. There's that Rob Liefeld one when he was on kayfabe recently, he was talking about Alan Moore's. Oh yeah. That was an excerpt. Like- that was an excerpt yeah. from the larger interview he did with them. And by the way, when I say he's insane, I mean that as a compliment. I, I really enjoy hearing Rob talk about his stories from from you know the history of the business. Yeah, because I, it, it, fascinating. Because he, he, he's the is he, is he the only creator who's doing a podcast? 
Um, I think he's not the only one. There have been others, but like, I think he's the only creator of that magnitude, certainly of that era, who is doing a regular podcast two days a week. I mean, he's really in it. You know, he's like, he's seriously doing it. Um, there's been indie comics creators for sure who've done podcasts, but like no one from that era that I can think of. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, I mean, obviously, like, you know, you know, like the era before him, those guys aren't. Those guys are all, you know, I mean, those guys are getting interviewed by Kayfabe, like, you know, Walt Simonson and Byrne yeah. and Miller and stuff like that. But that next generation of guys, like, like, you know, it's life, the image, the image era, you're not, you, those guys aren't doing it. I think you, did you say, that Tim King, he did a podcast for a while. But Tom, then he, Tom, Tom King, yeah, yeah. Tom King, Tom King did it, and then he transferred. The, then he became a serious writer. Yeah, yeah, he so, did. Yeah, Tom Tom King was a huge fan, I believe, of Eleven O'clock Comics, and then he and a bunch of other guys who were Eleven O'clock Comics fans, they launched a podcast. I forget what it was called because I never really listened to it, but they used to reference it occasionally on Eleven O'clock. But uh, but yeah, Tom King did that for quite a while, I think, uh, before he started writing comics. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a cool yeah, space. It's, interesting. it's a really cool space. It's interesting to, to be in that. About. Um, so, okay. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. You know, so what are you going to say? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no. I was going to say this because, because, because Tom King's story, I'm so off topic, but it just reminds me, his story kind of reminds me of like Francois Truffaut and like Jean-Luc Godard. Like, like those guys are like critics before they became filmmakers, you know, they were, Oh yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. And, 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 and their work was so influential because they had like absorbed it in a way as a critic and they were going, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know how I could do something that was like that blew everyone's mind. I think that's part of why the fact that Tom King is so successful so quickly is because he had, he had been like a critic of it, you know, and then realized he could do it. You yeah. Know? You know so, who else, you know who else did that in the screenwriting world, Chris? Um, one of my favorite old screenwriters, uh, Paul Atanasio, who yes. wrote uh, Quiz Show uh, back in the day, and also uh, I believe was technically credited as the creator of my favorite TV show, Homicide: Life on the Street, because uh, he wrote the pilot episode of it. He w- had been a film critic as well. Oh, and he also wrote, of course, uh, Donnie Brasco, another another classic film. Uh, but Atanasio, I think he was a film critic for like. The Washington Post. Yeah, that's what it is. I just looked it up. He was he was the film critic for the Washington Post from 84 to 87. And that preceded his writing career. And so that's another example like what you're talking about. Yeah, so a couple of people I know, a woman named Anna Klassen, she does that. Yes, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting about like, like the, the people's journeys. Um yeah. All right. I, I guess that is, I guess, is, is that it about this? Um, I think, I think that's basically it from the Giordano interview. It's, it's a fascinating interview. Uh, it's from issue number 100 of the comics journal, as you said, Chris. So I'd encourage everyone to grab this off eBay. If you're interested, it's actually a 244 page special anniversary issue featuring interviews with 26 top creators. And it's quite a, quite a laundry list of people interviewed here. Interviews with Neil Adams, Chris Claremont, Will Eisner, Steve Englehart, Bill Gaines, Steve Gerber, Dick Giordano, Archie Goodwin, Harvey Kurtzman, Danny O'Neill, George Perez, Marshall Rogers, Dave Sim, Al Williamson, Marv Wolfman, John Workman, Bernie Wrightson, and more. It's quite an issue. So, uh, yeah, definitely a great issue of the journal to check out. I will I will leave us here with uh, the final exchange from the interview between McDonald and uh, Giordano, just where uh, Heidi asks Dick uh, if he has any comments on the occasion of the Comics Journal's 100th issue. And I kind of like Dick's answer to this question. Uh, Dick says, yeah, yeah. He says, this is important, I suppose, because with everything that I feel about this industry, one of the things I've always been remiss in is communicating with the trade press. I've never written a letter to the journal. I've never written a letter to the Comics Buyer's Guide. I've never written a letter to any of them, even though I read them all every month, cover to cover. I enjoy the Comics Journal immensely. I sometimes disagree violently, and I sometimes agree equally strongly, yet I never find time to write them a letter. So I'd like to say, thanks for being around as long as you have. I hope you'll be around for another 100 issues, or certainly for as long as I'm in this business. Because even when I haven't agreed, at least 
it got my blood going. <laughs> so there you go. Words from there Dick Giordano. It's a, it's a good dude. Really interesting dude. And uh, I think we were very lucky to have him in the position that he was in at DC Comics for as long as he was, because I think he was a great advocate for uh, artists taking risks, as you hear him talking about throughout this interview. And I think he's a big part of the reason why, you know, along with Jeanette Kahn, of course, and Paul Levitz and everyone else who was there, he, he's a big part of the reason why we had the 80s be as incredible as they were. And we had our, our Watchmen and our Swamp Thing and our and our Dark Knights and our Batman Year Ones and also our, yeah, and our Thriller. Yeah, and our British Invasion. Yes. Um, okay, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Comics Rock Your Brain. And we will be back next week with a, another comic that you've probably forgotten about that we're going to give some time to. Uh, good night. Good afternoon. Good, night. good day. <laughs>